I remember when in the 90s, I, I made a few food sessions with monks really? after the mass. And when I, I got in, we had all this yellow mustard, and I got in a couple cases of wilderness. So I thought to myself, it was a desecration of the hot dog to not have you know, good spicy brown mustard on it. The number of people who wrote saying that the most important change they'd seen that year was that they had gulbis. They had a proper mustard to their hot dog. It was absolutely astonishing to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. I forgot the cum. These are the little fat yours. Yeah. Uh, all right, so Steve is not here. We do, on the other hand, actually have quorum. Uh, I'll call out uh, and let's get her on. Well, let me call us to order, and then you can. Right, we I just want to make sure she. I mean, oh. I'm happy to do. I can just at least call her so she. Yeah, you can start calling her. Yeah. But she's not part of the quorum. I was going to leave this. Actually, aren't we supposed to always like announce some sort of a remote participation policy? Yeah, right. luckily you're a regional chair because it's. You basically have to say that in the town of Amherst. The Amherst have, okay. Yeah, and you're citing references to MGL and stuff. Okay. Region, it's just okay. you have to announce it. Awesome. Well, I, I used to work for a state agency that also where you had, like, there was some written thing you had to read out. <laughs> Serena? We're one, we're one packet short. Are we really? That's very sad. Can I give him Steve's? Sure. Yeah. I you can. I'll get another one. He can go ahead. Okay, uh, so your work, she's working. We don't sign these during the meeting. Can we just let them decide to later? Uh, I don't know. I always consider it to be rude because yeah. it's almost an indication that either you're not really paying attention to what you're signing or you're not paying attention to what you're talking. So I never do. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure the connection works. All right. So I'm thinking I'm about the permutation to work people here. Um, I don't think I ever remember sitting next to you. If you're not hearing something, just type in. No. All right, thanks. Not a are we good? We are. Okay, so <laughs> seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, I'll call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee uh, at 6.31 p.m. Uh, the meeting is being taped for broadcast um, by Amherst Media, which we appreciate deeply. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, a member of the committee participating remotely. We do have a, pr a quorum present physically. Uh, and uh, Allison, are you there? Um, I am. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Eric. Well, the microphone is being now oriented more towards me and the rest of us. Can you hear me now? Yes. Cool. Awesome. Uh, since it's not executive session, I don't think we have anything out of the boilerplate around that, except for to make note of the fact that um, due to the remote participation, all of our votes will be conducted by roll call vote. I think that's it. Uh, so, someone says something? Okay. So the first order of business uh, will be approval of the minutes of October 16th, 2018. I don't know if people had a chance to look at the minutes or not. And entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, I move to approve the minutes of October 16th, 2018. Is there a second? I'll second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Kastensen. <coughs> Are there any edits? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of October 16th, 2018, signify by raising your hand. Uh, there are four ayes. Any nays? Any abstentions? Are there nays abstains? The motion carries. Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> Screwing up my own rules. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Demling, aye. Ordonez, abstain. Nakajima, aye. Kastensen, aye. S Donald? McDonald, aye. Thank you, which means it carries five to nothing to one. Thank you. Um, next order of business is announcements and public comments. Are there any announcements from the committee? Allison? Nope. Okay. Um, so we are open for public comments. Uh, if you have a public comment, please come forward and address the microphone. 
uh, state your name. You'll have three minutes to speak, um, and I will even get my all everyone's thinking about coming up. Seeing no one coming up, I'm going to close public comment period. Um, subcommittee updates. Um, LPAC representative, I assume that means we need to find one. Yes. Would you like me to want to remind one? people, Robert, sure. remind people what LPAC is? Yeah, and I think, um, I think in the packet, uh, Debbie shared some information about the Look Act, which we, yeah, it's, there it is, on the, right after the notes. I apologize. <laughs> Debbie had it right in order. Of course, I'm looking the wrong way. So uh, last year uh, in November, the Look Act was passed. We've talked about it more at the elementary, Amherst Elementary Committee in relation to uh, English language learners, uh, but one of the, another of the positive attributes of the Look Act was that it creates, it requires districts who are a certain size, um, and between our districts, we fit that um, size, and we're, we, we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do, even if we didn't sort of technically, we could get around it, uh, which is to create an LPAC, which is an English Learners Parent Advisory Council, and is modeled after CPAC, which people are more familiar with here. We had our first meetings last Thursday. There was one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, with pretty good attendance, particularly in the afternoon. Uh, and the idea is to get increase our um, participation and input from parents, guardians about the English language learner program. So Ms. Richardson, who many of you have met, who is our English language learner coordinator, facilitated that. There were many English ELL teachers and staff present as well. Um, so it's just getting started, but it would be great if there was a committee member who was willing to step forward to be uh, representative. I think much like CPAC, the plan is to have meetings roughly every month. Um, and again, the goal is to increase participation and input and feedback that we receive from the parents of English language learners in our districts. Wonderful. Any other further questions about that? Is this similar to CPAC in that there's one for both districts? It's, it's like shared? For all three districts, all three? yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think similar to CPAC too, I know Ms. Richardson met with the CPAC uh, president about just the structures that have been successful in CPAC and trying to emulate them. Any further questions? Or? Uh, would take a volunteer now or we'll take a volunteer later? Ms. McDonald, do you have any questions? Um, n no, if we don't, if nobody else is, is stepping up, I'd, I, I'd volunteer. Then we welcome it. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I'll make sure that uh, you're connected with Ms. Richardson about uh, future meetings and um, the agenda from the first one. Excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, so do we have any, any other subcommittee reports, like from budget and finance, for example? Um, <clears throat> just a, a quick announcement for the committee that the flowered folders that are in front of you um, have actually been prepared by one of our School Equity Task Force members, uh, a couple of, actually of School Equity Task Force members. You'll recognize some, a couple of the materials that are in here. Uh, one is a, um, the second uh, page here, which is stapled together, is actually the newsletter that uh, Dr. Morris had shared with all of us, mm -hmm. I believe, last week or maybe the week prior. Mm -hmm. uh, and it came from the students at the, here at the high school that have been working on the sort of justice program. These are, these are the you know, sort of student leaders. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't had a chance to read the email, it's been printed out for you. And uh, just I highly recommend it because it shows some of the enthusiasm and excitement from the students. Uh, the other thing you'll see here is a letter from former principal Mark Jackson uh, regarding his experience with the restorative justice program. As you know, he was presiding over the initial meetings that took place uh, when the program was started. <coughs> um, he has worked with the SETF for over a year, uh, you know, has had a couple of meetings with the SETF and has reported back to, to the SETF mm -hmm. on the progress of the program. And so he includes some of his thoughts in here that we thought you might want to you might want to see. And then finally is the uh, one of the pages of a report that was shared with the committee also a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding just some of the uh, disparity in discipline and uh, in education, uh, particularly among Black and Latino students. 
And so I wanted to highlight this because there's a lot of really important information that came through in this report. Um, and of course, it's work that we have been talking about and thinking about, and the SETF in particular has been very concerned with. And so we thought it was you know, a good idea to highlight this as well. So I just want to thank uh, two of our members of the SETF that are here with us tonight, um, Alisa Melnick and um, uh, Mary Lou Farrow, who's, who's also been working with this group for quite some time. Um, but in any case, just wanted to highlight this and make sure that people get a chance to read it. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Budget? Uh, we held a meeting at 5 o'clock. We reviewed three documents. The, um, a draft of the trust agreement for OPEB benefits. Uh, a draft of the, uh, the designer selection procedures. And we talked a lot about fees. And we took no votes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. Where are we now? Any any other subcommittees that want to report or offer any updates on their meetings? Yes. So just one question. I uh, I'm also sitting on the the board currently for the collaborative uh, for educational services and. I think it's more of a process question. So they will routinely share the director's report and some of the other materials. I don't know if the committee would like me to go ahead and forward that directly to the committee or if it should go to the chair and the superintendent <coughs> first. What's your preferred method for sharing things like that? Um, I guess what we typically do, it seems like a lot of things run through Deb. Yeah. <coughs> I'm sorry, I was typing. <laughs> 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 yes, the, it can come through me, okay. and I'm happy to get it out. Great. Cool. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay, and no other subcommittee updates? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, superintendent's update. Sure. Do we have a separate piece of paper for this? This is, is actually in the packet. Okay. Um, so the upside of getting in the packet is it previewed it. The downside is, of course, there's things that aren't in the packet that I then realize, right. so I'm going to orally share them. <laughs> um, but it's on the page right after the Look Act page, um, I believe. Yeah. You mean it's in order again? It is, thanks to Ms. <laughs> Rushmoreland. Um, and so... Um, this month, earlier this month, we partnered with uh, a group we partnered with before, PAIR, which is Political Asylum Immigrant Immigration Representation. Uh, they're based out of Boston, but there are some folks who are uh, parents, guardians in the district and other interested people who are connected to Western Massachusetts. And in this space, we offered a Know Your Rights workshop for our high school students. We did that a couple years ago, you may remember, but, you know, the thing with high schools is the kids change, right? So we didn't necessarily take the students who saw it two years ago, but, but also some of the content had changed. In fact, I think it changed three times in the month. They sent us the content of the slide deck a month before, and I think there were three iterations based on changes that were going on, in, particularly in the federal government. So I want to thank you know, Dr. Guevara, who is a primary contact, Dr. Gramacki, who's here tonight, um, interim principal Gramacki, uh, and I was able to attend part of it as well. And, and I was really impressed with the engagement of students. Um, their questions ranged from technical to political to what's the future of our country going to be to, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there because of confidentiality of, of their comments. But uh, what was new this time, uh, in addition to a slightly different um, set of information, was that the week after, students were able to, and their families if they wanted, to come in uh, and meet individually, because this is a group setting. Um, the first one, there was probably I think 20, 30 students present, so they were able to meet individually with uh, representatives from PEAR to talk about their individual situation and context and get individual feedback and advice. Um, so it was a nice thing that we were able to offer our students and, um, you know, I, I think without getting into exactly the content of the dialogue, it was one of the more poignant things to see. Uh, so, so someone like me, I was born in this country, I have a lot of privilege that comes along with that, and getting to witness students who don't have that privilege be able to interact with the larger context, which I read about, care deeply about, but don't personally experience in that way. One of the both poignant, scary, and um, I don't know, it was an experience that, that sticks with me, um, certainly. So I'm glad we were able to offer that for our students and their families. Um, the LPAC event I just mentioned a bit of. Um, so last week we had the first meetings. We did one in the morning and one in the evening, or af late afternoon, based on feedback that we could try to access families where they, when they were available. 
Uh, Ms. Richardson facilitated the meetings. Again, the afternoon one happened to be a lot better attended than the, the morning, but there was a lot of interest in being more involved in school. We had translators present and staff present because there's a range of languages that families speak, but highly successful start to um, a new venture for us. Um, Cross-country update, so just the girls and boys <coughs> teams won the Western Mass Championships and individually we had two students win the individual titles and for those who don't know cross-country that's like the same event. So the team runs and then the individuals are running as well. So the teams won and the first finisher for both the boys and the girls for Western Mass was from our school. Also at the middle school level, the boys and girls won team trophies at the Western Mass cross-country meet and also we had the boys and girls champions at the middle school level as well which is neat. Um, strategic planning, so on October 31st, which is Halloween, we had over 35 stakeholders, which included middle school, high school students, faculty, community members, and parents guardians engaged in the first meeting of strategic planning team. Uh, we set a context, we set goals for the work, we created norms, and we participated in envisioning what we'd want our school to look like in three to five years, and those 38 people, I think it was, are now crowdsourcing, getting more feedback from their communities. So when the group comes back together on January 9th, lots of work has happened about not just relying on 38 people, but actually getting their constituent groups to come and, and, and participate in getting that feedback as well. Uh, we had a college access uh, retreat. This is uh, all the way back on um, Indigenous Peoples Day. So we had uh, student uh, staff from the Family Center uh, work with um, UMass students from a certain sorority, uh, particularly for students who it's their, f their, their hope is to be the first in their family to go and attend and graduate from college. Um, so they don't necessarily always have the family um, background support uh, for that process because they're the first to go through it. So we provided some additional support uh, on that day and was, the feedback we got from students was, was highly successful and supported them into thinking that this, this whole thing called college applications was more doable and readily available to them. Uh, we'll hear more about this in December um, with a more detailed update, but we've had the math consultant uh, from Looney Math Consulting we are six to 12 math program. They've been in classrooms, they've talked to staff, they've been here twice. They also had two parent guardian uh, opportunities for feedback, as well as surveys that went to staff, students, and all parent and guardians at those grade levels. Uh, Mr. Sheen will be at the next meeting and he'll give a much more thorough, um, detailed review of that, but just wanted to keep folks up and because it, there were public events, want to make sure you're in the loop. Uh, last month, we had the opening of Mountaintop Bistro at Summit Academy, which was uh, uh, a really nice event. As you know, Summit Academy moved, and they now have a commercial-grade kitchen set up. And they always had a kitchen program, but now they have commercial-grade equipment. Uh, so it was a really nice event. A number of us, actually, frankly, who were in the room, uh, including Dr. Gramacki and some others here, uh, were present for it. I also want to say today was Summit Academy's, they have an annual tradition of um, a community Thanksgiving. Um, so that was, I think, actually lots of people you'll hear from in a little bit. All were there uh, as well as I was and it was just wonderful, tremendous amount of food. But the, you know, the big thing is how many families came in um, and just the, the community atmosphere it builds. Um, and the band played, which was great as well. Um, our students last month attended the MSAN conference in Boston, which was really nice for not to have to, the travel was much easier for our students. This was a treat to drive an hour and a half. Um, and we're hoping that they can come. It can get on the agenda for December. This was a tough night originally they were going to come, but families, you know, heading out of town for the holiday. And I just shared some links about, you know, the pre-reading so you get a sense of what they did before they, they were there, as well as a video that they shared with us from the conference. Um, as we'll talk about later, the Department of Education, the Massachusetts Department of Education is seeking public input in the expansion of Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School in Hadley. It would increase their maximum enrollment to 952 students. Anyone can offer input on whatever, however they feel about this to the Commissioner of the Board of Education at either charter schools, one word, at toe.mass.edu uh, on or before Monday, December 3rd, which is coming up soon. And just two more quick ones. One, you'll hear about this a little bit, but November 6th was Election Day, which for us was a professional development day. We are able to offer uh, high-quality professional development to all of our staff uh, on the topics of equity and social justice. I think, all, I think it was shared with all of you the different workshops that uh, were uh, offered, and you'll hear a little bit more in a bit. And lastly, thanks, shout out to Jody, wherever he is, and Amherst Media. So we've, doing, we've increased our window into ARPS episode load, and they've worked with us swimmingly on that. And so the recent one, which just came out yesterday, was um, by parent request, which was great. That's the first one we've had a parent email and say, I really want to 
hear about this, and it was about our English language learner program. So we had Sue Abdo, who's an ELL teacher, and department head of the high school, and Terry Geffert, who's the ELL teacher at Crocker Farm. So we had sort of the K-12 continuum of ELL services. And our next episode will be on the high school and getting an update on the high school. So Dr. Gramacki and Mr. Sadiq, so the interim principal and the assistant principal, will be joining me to uh, update the community on all things high school related. Sorry that was a mouthful, but um, it's been a while right. since we met. So. It is. It's been actually since October 16th, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's right. Any, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so just a question for the superintendent. I'm wondering if there uh, are any plans for the committee to hear more about uh, the math program at the high school, the math curriculum. I mean, understand there's been a couple questions raised about that recently, and so I'm just wondering if you know, there might be some room, upcoming agenda to hear more. Yeah, I, I, we were planning to have Mr. Sheehan talk about that, you know, in the broader context of their math review as well. Um, so I think we can do both. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. And at, and at the next meeting. At the, I'm sorry, at the December meeting. Yeah. Mr. Dunlin. Uh Yeah, so I had this, a similar question. So um, uh, <coughs> hopefully the scope of that is, is both the future planning and also what mitigations, if any, would be done this year um, based on whatever feedback you're getting and observations you're having. Um, thank you for pointing out the email and the deadline for the charter school uh, expansion proposal. Um, just uh, if, if you happen not to be here in two or three hours from now and you're in the audience for another item, um, school committee could definitely use the help in spreading the word about um, the importance of this. Uh, this is over a half million dollars a year at the regional level. It's one and a half million at the Amherst level and the school is essentially doubling, in, proposing to essentially double in size. So um, spreading the word about that, uh, however you feel about it, is, is appreciated. Um, and, and just a, a quick question I had about the strategic planning. Um, it seems like kind of a long period between the very first meeting and the next one. It's like over two months. Like, what's is there thoughts about what happens in the interim in order to keep progress going on that that very large, important project? Sure. Some of this was by design that you want to give people time to gather feedback from their constituent group. So if we offered people three weeks, then we know that not everyone would get as much feedback as they're we're hoping that they get. And the other is just that. The, trying to schedule that many people in the month of December when there's multiple holidays going on created a log jam, so we made the decision to have a longer period and also extend the amount of time that people have to get feedback um, from their neighbors, friends, and, and the larger group. But you're right, it, but it was um, intentional that way. You're right to say it was a long period of time. Rather. So we haven't, um, we haven't met since middle of October, and Toward the end of October, there were some extraordinarily challenging incidents nationally, uh, particularly in Pittsburgh. And I didn't know if you had anything to mm -hmm. offer the regional committee. Cause I, mean, I think you talked about this, the Amherst committee, yeah. but you didn't at the regional. We haven't met. And I don't know if you want anything you want to share with people. Sure. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so. Um, so after the tragedy in Pittsburgh, um, a group of high school students uh, engaged their administration and then, uh, then eventually me and wanted to get together to have a meeting to talk about how they were experiencing the tragedy and how um, it was influencing their time both at school and beyond. And so the students reached out to Dr. Gramacki, um, and then she reached out to me. I was in touch with the students, and uh, we asked the students if they wanted anyone else to be present, and so, um, Given my background in faith, they encouraged me that um, I'd be welcome to be there, as well as I reached out to the local rabbi from um, the Jew Jewish community of Amherst, um, and so he was able to attend. I want to thank him uh, again. Um, it was an incredibly stressful time for everyone, uh, and particularly for someone who's called on for many, many things, especially in the time of tragedy. And so he made time to come <coughs> over for an hour and a half on a Friday afternoon as he was getting ready for Shabbat. Um, Shabbat and um, spend time and so there was you know students they're in high school they have, some people could stay for a long time some people came in late but I, I would say all told over 30 students came not all of them Jewish some were allies to talk about their experiences and and again and, and this fall's been had, had a lot of them but it was incredibly uh, moving to hear the students talk about not just their experiences with Pittsburgh but their experience being Jewish living in western Massachusetts um, and I think the other thing that was so compelling was so many students who are not Jewish came in and either made connections to uh, what 
the Jewish community was feeling and how they felt uh, in whatever they, way they want to share, or just one, they, they thought it was important just to be a listener and just to be a supportive listener. So it's an incredibly supportive meeting. Um, it was hard. Uh, raw emotions were quite raw, but I think very productive in giving students a space. It was completely student organized, so the rabbi, myself, some staff were there. We were there as participants, uh, but two students who were organizers uh, facilitated the entire meeting themselves, and I think that was also telling. So um, it, it was something that I think students needed. Um, they, they voiced that. I checked in well after the meeting. There were many of them still there. and Checked in on how they were feeling, and there was a sense that uh, without an opportunity, a safe space to talk about how they were feeling, how they were experiencing uh, Amherst, um, Pittsburgh, living in this country, um, they, they really didn't have, not all of them had a mechanism to do that necessarily in, in as healthy a way with their peers. So I want to thank Dr. Gramacki for, for creating the space and, and providing support for those students and thank the students for taking on such leadership in the meeting. There are too many examples of this obviously these days in our society and they're, they're disparate in terms of who the targets are. Um, obviously in this case it's a grotesque act of anti-Semitism. Um, but one of the things that struck me is at the time being when you were talking to me about it and we were talking to the committee was that there was um, uh, kind of similar to some of the mass school shootings last spring. I remember if you listened to some of the high school students, it felt very immediate. That was similar in this case, that it was felt very, very immediate, very personal in the sense of insecurity. It felt very real and very personal. It's, I don't know if there's any, is there any anything that would be followed up on after that, or is it foreseen to be followed up on over the, I mean, not just about that particular incident, right. but in general? Yeah, I think, so, you know, we offer the student, you know, at the end, uh, one thing, so, you know, it, hmm. so in the meeting it had to be me and not me, right? So I wanted to be a full participant, and so that meant putting my superintendent hat somewhere else, and then I also had to put it back on at the end to make sure that our students got what they needed, whatever that was. And so um, when I came back and looped back around, there was about five or six students, and I said, you know, what is it that you need? And there is a student support group or student affinity group around, you know, um, Judaism and, and this kind of this structure that they had. And, you know, they said, you know, we feel like we're going to have to see how this plays out and what supports we need. Um, but I think the big thing that they got was that there was a supportive administration, a supportive staff. There were six or seven faculty members who were there just to make sure students felt like, you know, they needed it. was a Friday afternoon uh, at the end of a, a hard week. Um, so I think that at the time being, they expressed they got what they needed and that their, prof their uh, not professional, their, their organization, their affinity group would be, you know, going to Dr. Gramacki or others if there was continued sort of ongoing support. At a larger level, I think it does point to our need to be continually focused on issues of difference and how everyone feels included or not feels included. Uh, in, in all sorts of scenarios, both, you know, locally, but I will say that a lot of the conversation didn't revolve around high school. It revolved around what it meant living in Amherst, Leverett, Shutesbury, or Pelham, uh, living in Western Massachusetts, and I think that's true not just for this Jewish student group, but it's true for lots of groups in our schools that we, we focus, as we should, uh, so much on the school day, but uh, when you let students speak, they talk a lot about the experience that aren't Monday through Friday, 7.45 to 2.15. Uh, so that was the other takeaway for me was just how does this weave into larger community dialogues um, around um, what does it mean to be a multicultural community? Um, sorry, I could go on for no, it's, it was, at I, Well, we didn't have a chance to talk about it. Yeah. It was really valuable, too, particularly at the regional level. Yeah. Um, Ms. McDonald, do you have anything, I mean, anything at all you want to ask or say relative to the report? Um, no, thank you. <laughs> okay. Anything else in the committee? Okay, uh, seeing none, chair's report. So um, one of the things that uh, coming out of one of our last meetings where we did have a discussion, actually literally the last meeting, kind of, it's weird. Like we're, I'm on this cycle where our regional committee meets like every other week, you know, and so it's like we've had a really big gap between <laughs> meetings. Um, so uh, we, we had that great discussion with the, a school equity task force um, about not just the, the the goal the top line goals that the school committee adopted last year but underneath it a series of more concrete um, recommendations I think when you look at 
the superintendent goals for the year, some of them are actually reflected in there now. But one of the questions I have, and I'm throwing this out sort of as a planning practical question going forward, is there are, and we had those presentations last year, we, had, we know that there's work that's ongoing and has been ongoing um, that reflect a lot of these same goals. But it just, it just strikes me that as we're looking toward the budget season, and as we're looking toward uh, refining the strategic planning process, that um, the question of how do we optimally include, engage, align, and operationalize um, that the, what was presented in that memo becomes a really critical question. And so what I'm, I'm throwing this out now, because what I would like to do is maybe at the December meeting, have some kind of more in-depth conversation and I'm obviously looking at the superintendent because and, and actually it's kind of am too because if it doesn't come from you then it's not going to be worthwhile right as of, of what are we looking at here in terms of the next year and the deliverables I mean if you look in your <coughs> draft goals for example um, the strategic planning process and sort of delivering upon that process is one of the goals um, speaking kind of just for myself, but not really, because we did adopt as a committee the five goals as a top line thing. Um, it's hard for me to imagine getting to May or June and not having those goals in some ways reflected and operationalized within the strategic planning process, but sort of getting more granular of understanding about how that happens and where it goes is, I think, really important. And so I don't, I don't want to have a perfunctory conversation or one that feels like a sort of fly-by-night one, I'd want it to be actually more organized and more thoughtful. And particularly, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but particularly when you're looking at the next six months and you're thinking at time points where the SETF, either through its engagement with the strategic planning process or in some other venue, or with the like, art committee or whatever, or when we're looking at the budget, there are going to be different time points in which we could clearly engage in a, in a way that's both useful developmentally in terms of our overall process, but also very practically, right? Like, what are we doing this? What do we, how does it affect the budget? And if it does, how? Mm -hmm. You know, where we can then have a really sort of more granular conversation, but that's also feels productive and it feels like it's leading to something. Does that make any sense? It does. Okay. Is there anything else? If I can just add to that, I think, uh, you know, we've, I've spoken with the chair before and with the superintendent about, uh, the importance of continuity of our goals, right, and finding uh, a way for us to track our progress and make sure that we are continuing to move forward. And so that, you know, once we adopt a set of goals, um, that we understand, you know, this is something that we've, we've adopted, we've all agreed on is important. And so how do we then ensure for ourselves that we're actually making progress on this, you know, and, and some of the ways that we've talked about, you know, in data collection and uh, things like that, require, I think, our committee focus, right? Because in order to make sure that it's actually going forward and that we're funding it appropriately and that we're finding the resources and all that, um, I'm interested in thinking through what that means as we start these conversations around budget and everything, yep. you know? So if we can have that kind of a conversation, um, you know, just to build off of the chair's report, uh, you know, for the next couple of meetings, it would be really, really helpful. Yeah, and I think um, just one thing, and I don't want to skip ahead on the agenda, so I'm going to be cautious about that, but um, since some of the goals that SETF proposed do have budgetary implications, yeah. and one of the things we're doing tonight uh, is offering feedback for the administration on what to come back with a more detailed um, budget information about, it seems like there might be a, a happy marriage, especially thinking about the December meeting, of linking budget guidance that you offer us to come back with, and there's some information in there. Um, and some information that wasn't in the SCHF goals that Dorian and I, that Ms. Cunningham and I spoke about, well, you know, some of these things will have budget implications. So we can get to that when we get to it, but I just think there might be just a really natural way to start that conversation in December. I think, I think, there, I think there is, but I mean, I'm just not to put a fine point on it. To me, I, I want to look at the next six or seven months or whatever it is, right. because I think if we don't look at it in that frame, then it feels, it can feel episodic, right? Yeah. Like there's a certain, and also I'd rather we're never going to have enough money. And so I also would rather have a conversation. And in fact, who knows, maybe we'll, I hate to say this on microphone or the camera, 
who knows, maybe we'll end up in a world in which we're doing cuts again. I hope not, but we just don't know that right now. And so I also don't want to have a conversation about budget priorities and ads or whatever you want to do where we talk about it, where it seems sort of like too <laughs> rifle shot. It seems too narrow and focused mm -hmm. without looking at the big picture. Because one of the things I've said before, I know, said this last year, is that one of the challenges of this conversation is if one thinks narrowly about budget uh, in the given fiscal year, then the obvious answer is there's never enough money, right? And so then you say to yourself, well, we can't make progress on this goal because we don't have the money, so do we, do we commit ourselves to the goal because we don't have the money, right? And that sort of circular thing is endless, right? And the reality is it's not just endless, endless. It's like totally endless, right? We, like, we know that 10 years from now, whatever committee is sitting here, they will also not have enough money, which means we have to then, and this is sort of, I'm mean, it's got to be true of the strategic planning process, right? Is it can't be a world in which we're thinking without resource constraint, what do we want to do in the next 35 years? It's reality-based <laughs> exercise, right? It's got to be taken into account our constraints and, you know, maybe we're never going to have enough people in IT and data to do the kind of analysis we want. I don't know. If we're not, then we got to figure out how do we satisfy us getting where we need to go in a, in a reality-based exercise. Yeah. And so, anyways, my point is, so that look ahead for the next seven months and where are we going with all this and how does this fit into the conversation, how does it fit into budgeting and other decisions, seems to me to be part of the right way to do it because then we can more fully integrate Part of what I'm trying to do, and I sort of, I think we're all trying to do this, but I'm, this is something I really care about doing, so I'm going to use the first person singular. Part of what I'm trying to do is, is stop having conversations that feel like they're balkanized or in some ways, you know, it's this thing over here, right? I mean, we're doing planning for the whole district for a three to five year period. Like whatever we want to do with math, um, this has got to be integral to it, right? And I mean that literally. Like, if we need to make changes with math, that's literally going to be integral to whatever the planning is we do for the regional district. Well, so is this. So let's figure out how we do that, mm -hmm. how we get that stuff organized in a way that, that feels seamless and feels, you know, and is measurable and also is reality-based, meaning we don't have enough money. We, we never have enough money. So how do we make progress? Anyway. Uh, Ms. McDonald, do you have anything... I'm going to keep doing that every once in a while, by the way, just because yeah. otherwise you, you'll <laughs> have to you. yell or something. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. No, I, I, um, I agree with and, and support um, what you were just describing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's move on. Um, the first item of business, don't get to the business, is restorative practices. Um, do you want to introduce? Sure. Yeah. So... Um, Unfortunately, the, uh, our restorative practices facilitator for the district is not able to be here um, this evening, but I really appreciate uh, Dwayne Chamble, who is our out-of-school time coordinator and works through the Family Center, who is an enthusiastic supporter uh, of restorative practices, uh, is willing to come and share his, his experiences uh, being in circles um, and the implications for him. So a fair, fair statement, Dwayne? Okay. So I think you want to come up to the microphone? Yeah. Very quickly, if you can come on up. I just wanted to make a note for the committee, uh, if I can. Yeah. So uh, we had talked about having uh, the the head of the the restorative practices program here, um, but she is is away for a medical leave, I believe. So uh, the idea is that she and a group of students will actually be coming in January. Hopefully, we can get her on the agenda um, and make a presentation to the committee. You know, the students who actually were in charge of writing that newsletter, yeah, uh, to help share their experiences and their stories around, you know, having this this incredibly important program in their from their perspective. Uh, you know, just having uh, describe that through the agenda. You know, and having us learn more about it. So that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I just have. Um, some prepared remarks that I'm going to read and just to keep all of my thoughts in line but Perfect. hello to everybody that knows me and to everybody that don't. Um, my name is Dwayne Chamble and I'm the out of school time coordinator for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and I thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm here today to talk about my personal experiences with the healing circles conducted by D.W. McRaven here in the Amherst Regional High School. If you want to know, I'm sorry, I want you to know that what I'm about to share are my personal thoughts and feelings 
and do not reflect any influence from any outside source. I was invited to speak before you by DW and the SETF, and I feel honored to have been asked to share my perspective. The three main points that I want to touch upon while sharing my experience with you today are feelings, connections, and the idea that that kid, those students, they are all our children. See, these points are the foundation on which I believe we are building a new structure of love based on common bonds and mutual respect. When I, when I first arrived in this district three years ago, I was admonished by my mentor to treat all incidents with students and their families like they were my child and my family. This wisdom has been at the core of every interaction I've had, ranging from a happy good morning greeting before, at the before school care program, down to having a difficult conversation with a parent about an incident on the after school care bus with their child. In each and every case, knowing that I care for this child like they are my own, connecting with their parents to ensure that they know they are not alone, and feeling love, compassion, empathy, and care have shown me that the power of love and our mutual human bond for wanting the very best for our children is at the core of who we all are. These values I feel are essential to a healthy and happy community, and these values I have seen, felt, and experienced participating in the two healing circles conducted by D.W. McRaven. Now, there are a few core feelings that I, want to sh that I experienced while in the healing circles that I want to share with you all today. Those feelings are anticipation. There was sadness. It was isolation. It was fear. It was depression. It was loneliness. It was empathy. It was love. It was hope. It was a lot of smiling and then a lot of laughter. You see, these and many other feelings that are, not, that are not listed are alive in the hearts and minds and bodies of our children each and every day. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we can prepare today's field by nurturing tomorrow's soil to safeguard a fertile terrain for the seeds of destiny to be sown. Now, I know that was just a mouthful, but I want to explain, you know, what these seeds of def destiny that I speak about are. You know, these are seeds of love, these are seeds of belonging, these are seeds of caring, these are seeds of you are enough just the way you are, these are seeds of this too shall pass, they're seeds of I'm going to love you and support you no matter what. These seeds will surely, with the right cultivation, produce a beautiful harvest of loving, empathetic, and socially responsible young adults. So um, at this point, I wanted to just speak about my experience with DW and who she, who she is and how she conducts herself. So I feel like I could um, list many, type, many points to add to her credentials. But what I really feel that, especially in this profession, that more than credentials, that a person's character is the core of what we should be looking for. So I just thought about her and I said, you know, these are the things that came to my mind about who DW is and when you meet her, you know, you will feel this as well. I feel you'll feel this as well. The thoughts were commitment, a commitment, undying commitment to the students. It was compassion. It was expertise. It was purpose driven. It was unflinching. It was dedication. It was passionate passion, generational healing, and a, vision, a visionary, a pioneer. Um, and to close, uh, I just feel when I think about restorative justice and um, what that means to me, that means a, a proper alignment, a realignment to something that's natural, something that flows. And um, I feel that the restorative justice and what we're doing here is, a, is our part and our piece of realigning um, our community, because I feel that um, we as humanity, we as people, um, we've lost the connections, um, we lost the genuine feelings that we have for each other, and the thing that I feel that will bring us all together is that we all want a better future for our children. So if we come together on that point um, with this restorative justice, um, 
and seeing all of the kids that are in these circles as our kids because, you know, our kids have to deal with it. They come home with the stories and, you know, we're all in this together. So I just feel that um, continuing to do this practice is going to be our part to um, make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in that context, I'm glad you, you also said that this is almost like a preview of coming attractions. When did we have that meeting with VW? Was it last summer or spring? Um, the SCTF, I mean. I think it was, it was at the end of the spring or maybe, maybe even like early spring. Um, I think Ms. Cunningham, you might have been there maybe at some point in the beginning. I think it was in the spring. It was this spring. Yeah. yeah. So it's been it's been a while, and I think you know just um, to kind of wrap that up, and, and I want to say thank you, Mr. Shamble, so much for for um, for saying what you just said. Um, I think we've talked a lot here on the committee about the value of this program and why we wanted to bring it to the district, and to hear somebody articulate that in that way is incredibly powerful yeah. and moving. But I, I do think, you know, having sat with Ms. McRaven and having sat with even Principal Jackson, but hearing the almost the transformative experience that, uh, you know, folks who have been working in this, this program for a long time describe is an incredible asset to our district, right? And it's something that you see the value in, and especially when we, you know, we talk about Pittsburgh and we talk about so many of these other, uh, you know, terribly terrible, impactful events that have taken place, understanding that there is a program like this mm -hmm. that can actually help shore students up and also educators and staff simultaneously, right? Because it's not just about the students. It's also about the other people that are experiencing it with them. And, you know, again, you'll see the letter from, from Principal Jackson hearing him talk about it from somebody who had, you know, never experienced that before to someone who had gone through, you know, sat through a circle and talked with Ms. McRaven and talked to some of the students and going through that learning process yeah. was so incredibly important and transformative. And you understand this is why we're doing what we're doing, right? This is why we're investing the resources and the time and the money into a program like this because it actually pays dividends in so many different ways that we don't necessarily understand even now, right? But I think that, you know, having an opportunity to hear directly from the people who have both led that program and participated in, in the way that they have and hearing from the students um, is just going to be incredibly powerful for the committee. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, my, my recollection of the meeting we had last spring, I guess it was, was um, how incredibly powerful the work is and also how hard it was to get your head around what it actually was without having a sort of a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time being thinking I wanted the school committee to go through a circle. Mm -hmm. um, but if we, if we <coughs> don't, which I still think would be a good idea, um, if we don't, we'll make that decision after January, right? Because it has to be a group decision <laughs> that we would do that. Um, yeah, we might need it after the budget process, right? <laughs> I think it's always a good idea. I mean, based on what I was hearing, I think it's always a good idea. But my, my point is, though, is that um, you need to hear about the actual work to sort of get it. Otherwise, it sounds, it sounds very impassioned and transformational, but also it's, it sounds slightly abstract <laughs> until you really get into understanding what, what the work really is. So I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you again. Anyway. Uh, HR. To, this is a uh, this is a really well described item. <laughs> HR department update. I don't. I'm not even going to throw this to you, Superintendent. Like I'm not even going to do that unless you demand to step in. I don't. I thought you would introduce us. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Sorry, I'm getting different feedback from different sides of the table. So, uh, no, actually, I would like to do a brief introduction. I'm just, I was just teasing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, no, I really do think uh, kind of a couple of things I want to say as an introduction. One is I really want to thank uh, the department for being here, not just Ms. Cunningham, but the full department, and I think that shows the teamwork that this this group has. Um, I also think, and related to the prior conversation on SETF goals, um, oop, that's not a good screen on that one. No, um, okay. that one's fine. Um, I don't know how to solve that one, so I'm not going to. Um, 
I think um, I think tonight, and there's been updates since what's in your packet, just with a little more refined data. Um, so what you'll see on the screen will uh, have some of that. So I do think it's also responsive to um, some topics of conversation as it relates to staffing and percentages that um, the community has been asking for. And you know, I'm pleased that we're not there, but we're showing a lot of significant progress. And and I think finally, it shows the range of. Um, topics and areas critical work of the district that uh, one department is able to to work on it's not just one aspect and even from the kind of slide deck that's in the packet i think you get a sense of the wide range of tasks and responsibilities um and critical responsibilities the department takes on so with that i'll pass it over mm -hmm. to miss cunningham and her team well good evening everyone um, last year we started off a new hr department and our department consists of Damani Gordon, our diversity equity specialist. We have Sasha Figueroa, who's my assistant, and we have Jennifer Ortiz, who is our HR administrator. So when we started, we, we created five goals that we wanted our department to fulfill for last year. And this update will just let you know how we did with those goals. So our HR department is really three people and my assistant. So all the things that you're going to see was done by this miraculous team. <laughs> so in this brief overview, we're going to talk about the great things. Uh, we have a slide that congratulates our district and gives you more information as to the great things that we're, we've been doing. We'll also look at the goals that we had and then um, answer some of the SETF questions as to staffing <coughs> and how we've progressed towards our diversity equity goal. We'll talk about the waivers and trainings and we'll touch a little bit on the futures program because Damani is integral with that program. Then we'll leave it open for questions. So first we wanted to congratulate everyone on the hard work that they've been doing. We've ranked um, the best place to teach in Massachusetts on niche.com. We're also number nine in the best of the best school districts in Massachusetts, number 24 with the districts with the best teachers in Massachusetts. So I think that's just, it showcases the hard work that everyone does from the administrators down to everyone, to all of our staff and our faculty and making this one of the top 25 places in Massachusetts to work in and to do business in. So our goals when we started last year, we um, plan to hire and retain quality diverse staff. We plan to assist our administrators with the license and our educators with the licensing and waiver process and with anything that they needed such as um, help with grievances or complaints or concerns uh, amongst the staff. We look towards uh, training. We help to advance. Our hope was to advance many of our staff members within our district to a higher level and to um, continue to build relationships and partnerships with our community. So as far as retaining and hiring a diverse staff, here are the statistics. <coughs> this chart just talks about, gives each department and how we've done. So in 2017-18, in each of these departments, these were the total number, including the hires that of people of color that each department had. So if you look at the business office, for example, um, in 2017, 18, there was one person, and now we have two. So going all the way across, we see that there's been an increase in most departments. Right now, the two departments where there was a decrease, we're still in the process of hiring additional staff for those two departments. So those numbers are the staff of color? Yes. Compared to the total? Mm -hmm. So here is, you can find this information on the DESI website. So if you look at the top boxes, that's at the regional level, and then the bottom boxes are at the Amherst level. And the, uh, the numbers in the parentheses tell you what percentage of our staff, total staff, mm -hmm. are in the, um, have chosen that demographic to, um, to call themselves. So if you look African American in 2016-17, we had 17. 
Now in 2018-19, at the regional level, we have 35, which is 12%, 12.5% of our staff. Same thing for Amherst. In 2016-17, we had 16, which was 5%. And now in 2018-19, we're almost at 7%. Now this one was interesting because here what we did was we took the student demographic <coughs> because I know SETF has asked how do we compare to our students and they wanted to, one of the goals they had for the superintendent was to have our um, staffing increase to reflect the number of students. So if you look in 2016-17, African American at the regional level we had 6.7%, um, now in 2018-19 teachers all right, the teachers are the numbers in the parentheses. So teachers are 12.5, and our students are at 7.11. Don't, don't change it yet. If you continue to look, there's been an increase. There's two categories where we really need to work to improve, but we are working on it. So when you look at the um, Asian and the multi-race, non-Hispanic categories, those two are still very low, but we are working to increase the number. And our retention rates, this is also on the DESI website. So in 2016, we retained our retention rates were 73%. And in 2018, we're at 90.8%. But is that the retention rate of staff of color or the total retention, the total retention rate? That would be interesting for the staff of color, the retention rate. So next, we'll be talking a little bit of how we were assisting our administrators with um, whole, the whole licensure process, so our administrators and our educators. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, something that we incorporated that's different from years past is the evaluative tool that we use, which is my learning plan. We inserted new fields where teachers can keep track of the licenses that they hold and the dates that they expire. Yeah. Um, so whether it's initial, professional license, and each of those category, categories, excuse me, have their own, they have different parameters around their expiration dates. But it also gives administrators an opportunity to go in and see which of their teachers hold what licensure mm -hmm. and when those licenses will be expiring so that everyone can keep track of where they are in their licensure process and where they need to be or be moving towards. Um, so this is just a quick overview. We've also included the public lookup so that you can just, you know, administrators, teachers themselves, they can look themselves up, but administrators can look up their teachers or if they're looking to hire someone um, and they want to see what licenses that person has to fulfill whatever needs they have in their buildings, they can quickly go in and see if they're licensed in that area or not. Right. So one of the, um, this change came as a result of the spring conversations that we had where uh, there was a question as to what do we do for teachers to make sure that they know where they're at and for administrators, how do we help them? So this is permanently on my learning plan. Every administrator that goes into my learning plan to do the evaluation of the teacher, this is the first screen they see. Every teacher who's going in to input their goals, this is the first screen that they see. And they cannot go past this screen without responding to it. That's right. Mm -hmm. What percentage of teachers and administrators do not hold licenses? We're going to get to that. So uh, this is a comparison of last year to this school year and the amount of waivers that we've had to request. As you see, we've had to request less than half of the amount of waivers that we had to request the year before. And 100% um, of our administrators are all licensed. Um, and some of the reasons are outlined here of why we even have to go out and request a waiver to begin with. Um, what we found this year were outstanding MTEL requirements. So one of the hardest or one of the biggest barriers for people to be licensed is the MTEL, is passing the MTEL. And we've included here um, an example of one of our educators who's, had, who's tried four times to pass the MTEL and they finally passed it, but it takes that amount of time and effort in order to be licensed. So we've had to also um, wait for endorsement letters for other dis from other districts. We can't provide them ourselves for incoming teachers, so we have to wait for other districts to provide these endorsement letters to prove that they've passed certain requirements so that they can achieve licensure. Um, and we also have very unique 
slots and, and opportunities in our district where you have to have dual licensure. So for instance, you may already hold um, a, core, a license in a core subject area for math, in math, for instance, but if you're working um, with a group of special education students, you also have to be licensed in special education, moderate disabilities. So um, you may be licensed in one area, but we need to help you get licensure in the other area. So while you're achieving those goals and while you're, you're checking off those requirements, you need a year of to be on a waiver in order to advance into your license. So those were the reasons that we found this year that we needed to request the waivers that we did. And so one of the questions that may be going through your head is what are we doing in HR to help with this situation? So with the MTELs, we are offering MTEL prep courses uh, for some of our teachers and you know, uh, through the Futures program, we are able to have our courses offered for free. Many of our teachers are taking advantage of that so that they, um, the person here who we talked about who took the MTEL four times, that individual actually went through the prep course and was able to pass the MTEL after. All right, next um, I want to talk about uh, the trainings that we have had this year. Uh, based on diversity, inclusion, sensitivity, and other practices. Um, these are the trainings that we've had, um, hiring process, um, and that's based on, you know, getting together a pool, a diverse pool of folks um, in order to strategize and um, get the right person and the right um, fit for our schools and our district. Um, implicit bias. Um, implicit slash affinity affinity bias in hiring uh, those three um, trainings were done during admin week uh, right before we start school when all the administrators are there uh, we also have uh, licensure that we just talked about types of uh, renewal and processes and we also had um, as superintendent talked about before the November 6 PD day recently um, we offered 22 uh, different workshops. There were options uh, for our teachers and parents that wanted to be involved. Um, some of the trainings that we had, just to give you an idea, was um, getting to know restorative justice at ARHS, um, and that was youth-led by some of our students. Um, the N-word in the classroom, teaching racist language without harm, creating gender-inclusive classrooms, and laying the groundwork for having difficult conversations about race. Those are just a few of the uh, trainings during the PD day that we had. And there's also the UROC, the Undoing Racism Organizing Collective. Um, all except four of our administrators attended that, um, and the four that weren't there will be uh, participating in one coming up very soon in Hartford, Connecticut. So the first three trainings that are on there, those did take place earlier in the year. But we're also cycling back in January to continue with these conversations and these trainings because we're coming again to another hiring season and we want to make sure that the administrators understand their own implicit bias in hiring and help to increase the likelihood of having a diverse staff. Also, part of the, um, the licensure and wanting to make sure that our administrators understand licensure, our teachers understand licensure and their requirements, We've um, started to hold licensure training during staff meetings. Some of our principals have asked, us, actually at the request of their own staff, of their own faculty, they've asked us to come in during staff meetings and give a quick overview of what they need to do, the different types of licensure, when they expire, what PDPs are, how many they need, so, um, so that people are better prepared and well-versed in, in what they're, they're, they, they need to do in order to, to remain qualified. Without telling any tales out of school, um, I guess we're in school. Um, how did that go? I mean, were there, were there, was there a lot of active learning on the part of folks who were trying to understand implicit or affinity bias in hiring? I mean, was that, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like without, <laughs> I'm not looking for any scuttlebutt, but I just mean, I'm just curious how that went. I believe it was very eye-opening mm -hmm. for a lot of our administrators to see, um, just certain things such as jargon being something that they hold fast to, to when they're hiring and how a lot of um, our 
individuals of color may not use jargon but may say the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it was very important for them to see their own bias in making sure that a candidate uses jargon before they hire them. You want to ask? Yeah. yeah, if you don't mind. So um, one thing that I do is just any of our sessions during administrative week we get active feedback on and the and it's anonymous um, and the anonymous feedback we received from our team was that it, it, it supported everything Ms. Cunningham just said in terms of thinking differently about that process and, and what biases we all bring to um, that and you know I think coming back to it as Miss mm -hmm. Cunningham said as we enter this season makes sense but I do think it it opened a lot of eyes um, because it was a simulation exercise it wasn't like a academic mm -hmm. exercise that the team put on Here's some images of our PD day that our communication specialist <laughs> provided um, of, of the different sessions that we had. Some were held in the auditorium, they were held in individual classes, but um, we actually sat through one of the sessions. Um, it was very eye-opening. How actually, I, what struck me most was how receptive the teachers were. It was a difficult topic. It was how to use the N-word um, in the classroom. Um, without creating harm, and they were just so receptive and open to learning and creating a safe space for their kids when they're teaching literature that can be very difficult for, for students of color to hear. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Who was actually teaching these classes, these courses? We had some. Or, sorry, sorry, no, just the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. sorry. No, 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 no Superintendent Mike. <laughs> Mike's good. Um, <laughs> so some of the we actually had some of our own staff members teaching a few of the courses. We had um, professors from Smith College. We had another professor from. I think the two professors were actually from Smith, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And then our Springfield own College. Springfield, one of the one from Springfield College, um, and then, like I said, our own staff members uh, teaching the courses, which I thought was really nice to have our staff mm -hmm. learn from their own from their colleagues. And there were some that were student-led. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And just if I can ask just a follow-up question, mm -hmm. uh, are, were these, you know, the folks from Smith and, and others um, here in the staff, were they people who, you know? gotten degrees or like how, what, what's their level of expertise I guess on, on these issues so they they teach these same uh, subjects in their own in their own classrooms in school and in the universities in which they teach and they've also worked with some of our own staff members so I believe the professor from Smith had come before and worked with one of our English teachers here at the high school so there was a relationship there and yeah. the staff that were here that were teaching it are they also what's how, how do they come up to their expertise um, I think they were vetted by our assistant superintendent and also by our curriculum direct uh, coordinator, Tim mm -hmm. Sheehan, about the subjects that they would be leading, the sessions that they would be leading, and what the material would be that they would be providing their staff members. Right. And some of them are professors at local colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just experts in their field, and their, their colleagues have recommended them to um, be the person to lead that discussion because they've been in their classrooms and have noted some of the things that they've done. Um, all of them <coughs> have received at least an exemplary <laughs> on their ratings and, and um, for their evaluations and such. But like I said, most of them are well known and they do a lot of presenting in uh, other conferences. So they've been recommended by their colleagues or their professors elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, and these are um, after our PD day. We had we took a survey um, from everybody that was involved in attending, and these are responses that we had, 158 responses, um, and how satisfied you are uh, with the PD day and what you learned that day. Um, you know, one's the lower end, as in not as satisfied, and five, the top, you know, extremely satisfied. And as you can see. Um, you know, there was a lot of people who were satisfied and definitely engaged and empowered um, by these trainings that we've had. Mm -hmm. So out of the 158, there were only about three that were not very satisfied. And the reasons were that we were 10 minutes later um, than we had anticipated. Um, so those were the, that was the, the big reason, was we started a little late, so we ended a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you? So out of all, how many staff were involved in total? All of the staff. Which is how many? So we have over, what? Over 660 staff. Right. Okay. But 
not all attended. So about 500, yeah. maybe? Yeah. One of the comments after the PDC session was that the although I tend to dread the idea of PD for the entire district since our needs are so diverse. I really enjoyed the day and I think it was well run and I learned something in each of the sessions I attended. Another comment said having students present was the best keynote possible. So our, our uh, keynote speech was done by about five or six students and here's the feedback. And these are the next steps. This is a question posed to staff. Um, what other resources do you need to implement what you've learned today? And um, the responses uh, were about time, you know, time to implement, to work more with colleagues, um, to gather in professional development communities and walkthroughs. Um, as we know, um, you know, the schedules are so, always so tight for the teachers and um, just more time to get those things together so we can implement those. Um, and the other um, what we, what we learned about this was um, training, um, workshops at the next level, and support staff for implementation. So more of that. All right. So as a department, we always talk about not having the one and done training. Mm -hmm. And so we are looking uh, to continue with the training, but we're also looking to help the staff to use the information that they've learned because it, there would be no point in continuing the training if they're not using it and it's not trickling down to our students. So we're working on trying to find ways to um, make sure that what they've learned is being used into the class in the classroom. One of the things that we really focused on and um, one of our main goals is to advance our own staff. So uh, with the next slide, we'll be able to go a little further into it. Um, we've, we're looking to advance staff on every level. So not just from peer educators to educators to teachers, but we're also looking to advance our custodial staff. And we've been able to advance two members of our, of our custodial staff in two positions in roles of leadership where they're overseeing larger amounts of people. They're overseeing larger square footage. Um, with our Futures program, which Damani has been an integral part of, we have three paraeducators who are going through the program to then become teachers. Uh, we have five teachers who are have stepped into administrator roles. And um, even on our food service level, we're also looking to advance our own staff. So we've had two general food service workers who have come up into positions of cooks. So this is something that we're looking at across as a district-wide um, goal of ours to advance our own staff to so not always look outside but also look inward and see where our that we have talent within our within our own staff and move them forward. Another thing that we were really uh, that we've been working towards is building our own relationships and partnerships in the community and the these are the following collaborative endeavors that we've had. So we have our Amherst Futures program through Mount Holyoke where if paraeducators hold at least a bachelor's we can move them forward into the Mount Holyoke program, to the program, the Futures program, where they can earn a master's uh, through Mount Holyoke and also become licensed educators. We have our five colleges diverse teacher workforce where we're looking for a diverse um, teacher staff that represent our students. We have been working with UMass. We've been um, in hand in hand with them with their teacher prep programs, so accepting their students into our district so that they can do their prep programs and their internships. We've been working with Smith College for professional development, as we mentioned, mentioned earlier, which was during our PD day. Um, and the Mass Hire Franklin Hampshire Career Center, what we've been doing with them, our work with them has been centered around our custodial staff. So moving them forward into journeyman positions where they can then enter into the maintenance field, which offers, it opens up more opportunities for them in the district as well, and even outside of the district. Right, and another thing that Jen has been working with UMass with is helping our teachers who would like to become administrators to move into a program like that. And uh, UMass is looking and hoping that we will partner with them and have some of our administrators teach those courses. Um, also, as uh, was mentioned, the Futures program are for individuals who currently hold a bachelor's, whereas we're working with UMass to work with those who do not currently have a bachelor's so that they go through um, possibly university without walls to get the bachelor's and then move into the programs where they can become teachers. Uh, 
here's our expansive list of our other HR tasks. It's just it's highlighting the work that continues in our department. Um, one of the greater pieces of work that we have is trying to resolve staff complaints. Uh, last year alone, we had 43 investigations, not including the grievances and uh, complaints that just come through and assisting investigations that come through our office. Um, we, a lot of our time is dealt with trying to, trying to resolve uh, concerns that our staff members have so that we can have a happy uh, group of teachers and, and, and staff members in front of our, teaching our students, right, and helping our students. Um, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham leads the second year teachers meetings and they've been focusing on social justice. We've negotiated four contracts with our administrators, our teachers, our paraeducators, clerical staff, maintenance, custodial, and food services. We transitioned uh, over 660 staff members to our new health insurance plan over the last spring and summer, uh, not including our retirees. Um, and as always, our ongoing work with recruiting uh, diverse staff um, in a variety of, of roles, whether it's teaching, paraeducators, food service, custodial. Um, employment verifications, workman's comp, we facilitate and participate in conferences. Um, we're, we're called upon for those, for those as well. Um, furthering our partnerships and our program development so that we can help our staff grow. Uh, licensure support for educators, the hiring and onboarding of staff. Um, collecting and uh, disaggregating various data. So a lot of times we're called upon to provide information for our administrators on what's going on in their schools. How, you know, how many teachers do I have licensed in this area versus that one. Um, leadership work and membership, uh, support groups, the, enroll the enrollment working groups, standardization of quarries, which we've been able to do uh, district-wide mm -hmm. also for our student interns. So before that was, uh, it was pretty much segregated per school. They were doing their own collection of quarry information, and we've, it's become a centralized system now where all student interns come through. Uh, volunteers, interns, observations, they all come in through a central office, and then we help, uh, along with the universities, we help uh, position them in the different schools. Right, Sasha? Yep. Thank you, Sasha. That oversees all of that. Yeah. Our hiring process, our communication, social media, um, and the other list of, of things that we do daily in our office. So our goals for next year, the, the goals that you saw, um, we just reported on for last year, and now we've decided, okay, we're doing okay with that. But um, what we need to continue to do is to continue to hire and retain a qualified, diverse staff. We saw the two areas where we were way behind that we know that we will like to go out and network and increase participation rates and hiring rates for those two groups. Um, we're working with the Alana Cabinet to review data and create action plans for different things. So they've asked for some information on our special ed groups and, um, and also on our teacher retention rates. Um, we're looking to create some programs. So we find that in HR we're doing so much with the adults and hiring that we don't often get a chance to see the effects, right, of our hires. So we'd like to start going into the classrooms more. <laughs> I know there's only four of us, but we'd like to get into the classrooms and see how great a hire we have done, right? And then create some of the programs that are needed for our students for social justice. We're also looking to increase the use of restorative justice and restorative practices in the district. So um, I know that we mentioned previously how DW is working with the students, but we'd like to start using restorative practices with the adults in our district. And we're going to continue with our trainings. Any questions? Ms. Tremling? So thank you for this very comprehensive presentation. I, I would just reflect a little bit of the congratulations that you gave at the beginning back to the, the HR department, this, this small, agile, effective team. I, I don't think you get to be the number one place to teach, right, without doing something right when it comes to HR. So it's given the size and complexity of our organization, the fact that you have three to four people doing all that is, is pretty amazing. So I think you should feel pretty good about that. Um, so a couple of, of short questions, but mostly on the, um, the uh, diverse staff and demographic charts. Um, if we get the updated version of that uh, electronically, that would be it's good. It's in box. Okay. Oh, it's in. Okay, great. <laughs> um, 
And uh, it, actually, if you could send, I don't know if you have like the, the PowerPoint version as opposed to just the PDF version, so that we could like, you know, copy and paste the data and move around. Because one, one thing, opportunity I was thinking of, and, and I don't know how far back this data goes, like, you know, it starts at 2016, 2017, but I think without too much of an effort, we should be able to, you know, craft some sort of simple, just standard chart of, of, um, of trend, like a line chart that shows the, the percentages for staff and compared to students. And then every year when this question comes up, we, it could just be a matter of updating the source data, and then we're always looking at the same uh, format, right? Um, we might have to tweak it depending on, on what we're looking at, but, um, but I, you know, I, I see the, the seeds of, of what could be a standard version of that. I'm, I'm sort of hearkening back to the, I don't know if it's now defunct data trends subcommittee, whether we folded that in, but um, this is the kind of thing I was thinking of for that, um, that kind of effort. So, um, yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah. The congratulations page. Do we advertise this? Do we tell people about this? Do we put it on our website? Are we the only group who sees this? I know teachers and administrators were told, and they were excited about it. <laughs> well, I meant um, the general community <laughs> needs to know this, too. Do we tell them? Yeah, so we, we have put it on our social media networks um, and other things like that as well. Um, and I think it, I do think. Um, we get strong candidates for positions because it is we are seen as a good place to, to work and teach. So if you look at, um, you know, for many years, I uh, for five years, six years, I worked at the first year teachers, and our first year teachers are generally first year teachers to Amherst. A very small minority are truly first year teachers, and when we ask people why they left whatever the district is, is because we do have a reputation of being an excellent place, a good employer, and um, I think this is the data to back up what. Um, we've done and, and what we've seen over the last couple of years. It's just that a number of times we've had these presentations which contain good news and we hear about it, but I'm just wondering what mechanisms are used to let the general public know about it. Yeah, and perhaps there, we can do some reflection about you know weekly newsletters and things like that that might uh, be able to highlight those things. It's a really good piece of feedback. Ms. McDonald, do you have any questions or comments? Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, I don't. Okay. Uh, Ms. Arenas? So, um, I also just want to say thank you. I mean, I've worked, I think, with most of you independently and, and know for a fact how hardworking you are. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, that actually brings me, though, to a question because it strikes me, you know, I think it's incredibly important to see, I think, I forget how you phrased it, Ms. Cunningham, but the connection points between the, the hires and what's actually happening in the classroom. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if instead of having the HR staff be the ones to actually go into the classrooms, if, if maybe we might think about the ways that the district can incorporate or fold in this work into other departments, right? So just thinking about, like, for example, you know, the, the curriculum director, you know, thinking about those AP classes, is this something that, you know, maybe is, is shared with you know, the, the curriculum department, per se, which I think is like two people also or something. Um, but just ways of incorporating a little bit more of other elements or departments or staff, you know, in central office that can shoulder some of this burden and help disseminate it a little bit more. And I think that, that actually ends up serving a couple of different purposes. One is it helps to carry out the work that you're doing a little even more broadly and you know and, and help uh, you know involve more people that that could probably bring different perspectives but could also maybe benefit from seeing those connection points um, and I know you work you all work very closely anyway in central office but you know just thinking about formalizing that like how does that work uh, but then also I think practically speaking you know I worry a lot about burnout and worry about you know a small already overtaxed <laughs> staff to be carrying on even more things as important as they are uh, it feels like for sustainability you know it's it's uh, even more important perhaps to think about you know how you bring in more people into that kind of work so that it's a little more spread out um, take that for what you will I think it's just it strikes me when you're you know, talking about that you know how we can we can help short burden but I have just one more uh, question and this was uh, sorry, going back through my notes. Um, so this is the form around licensure. Um, 
And I think I had raised this at an earlier time when we were talking about licensure in the spring um, very intensely. And, you know, I was wondering at that time, and I'm still wondering, if there is a concurrent process that exists so that, you know, it's, it's almost passive when you have information on a website that people have to go to that says, you know, a public lookup of your current val valid license can be found here. I think that that's valuable because it's, it's information, but the person actually has to know enough to go to that form initially, right, to look that up. Uh, so I, I guess I'm wondering if any thought has been put in or any, any protocols have been put in place to proactively inform uh, staff or at least to just say, hey, reminder, you know, we've got your license on file for this amount of time. You know, our records are indicating that you're going to be, you know, due for a license renewal or whatever, um, just so that we are ahead of that ball, right, on a regular basis. So there are two things uh, that occurs. One, Desi sends them an email to let them know. And two, we also, in addition to all the things that we say we do, we audit all staff's license. And we send out a reminder to them and the union and their principals to let them know that they're either uh, coming close to being due or are overdue. And like I said, um, with this, they are going on proactively every year and when the principal is alerted that, you know, there may be something that uh, is coming due soon, the principal also reaches out to the staff. Um, one thing I wanted to, to touch on, too, was when I talked about us going into the classroom, it's just to see the fruits of the work that we've done. So um, we're, we're here and we're hiring, but we never get a chance to really go into the classrooms. And I'd like us to be able to go into the classrooms and just enjoy it, you know, and, and see what what's what the results are for our, our new hires. I hear that. Thank you. I think that's actually a good yeah. a good practice in the same way that also some of the ways you're thinking about taking feedback from professional development, I mean, staff, colleagues. Mm -hmm. but the point is getting that feedback and then thinking about what is this, how do you build next? I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. we were talking about before was thinking about how um, essentially the programming you're doing now is going to be either reinforced like a mid-year hiring affinity and bias mm -hmm. and sort of look back and then looking at this year's programming and saying well what do we do next year and how do we build on it right. what feedback you got i think all those things that kind of break down silos and move it away from being i hate to put it this way because i know you're not doing this but like rather than a pro forma exercise where you're sort of saying we've we've done this work isn't that great but I mean, as, well, as much as you're going to celebrate going to the classroom, mm -hmm. you're also going to get really sort of enriched feedback from that mm -hmm. and experience that's going to inform and improve the work you do next, which mm -hmm. I think is great. Sir so Dunham? Um, yeah, so kind of building on Ms. Menino's point, um, I'm, I'm looking at our next item, which is budget guidance. And I think I know the answer to this question, but I'd love to hear from you directly is we're going to talk about marketing, communications, and social media, and all this good news that's happening. and wanting to express that to the community and, and our potential students down the line. Do you feel like your staff has enough time? Do you, have, do you feel like you have enough resources to, to do all that you want to be doing? So if I say no, will we a lot more funds? <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to be honest. <laughs> sure. That's okay. So, um, so I'm connecting this question uh, back to actually something Mr. Dona said, if that's okay, uh, which was about just the number of people we have doing and the number of tasks there are to do. Mm -hmm. So if that's okay, Mr. Dumbling, I want to attack it from that point of view. So I do think, um, and, and um, it's not just an exercise, I mean, we do talk a lot about work-life balance, um, and that's true for this department, it's true for other departments at central office. And I think it, it gets challenging when the number of tasks are increasing and the number of um, folks we have working at central office have significantly decreased in the last five years. And so I think there is a challenge in that. And, and you know, unfortunately, we've had, um, to Mr. Nakajima's point earlier, when we we're making budget decisions, and we've tried our best to keep it as far away from students as possible. I think the challenge is that what th these folks do is they're the critical support for the people working directly with students. And that balance is sometimes um, a challenge when we're faced with 1.2 million dollar budget cuts is what's the right balance on that and the year before we cut some other um, significant number and uh, I think sometimes that gets lost in the budget discussions by myself included right that we try to think about 
you know, what's the number of students in that class, and that's critically important. But what these folks do, it's not just a list of things or a bullet list, it's that they're actively supporting the work of the educators and staff that we have in the district. And if, you know, Mr. Sheehan's here next month and he's talking about curriculum, you'll see that that work is critically, and I'm not taking take the attention off this department, but that work is critically important for supporting teachers to make next steps in how we're relating and supporting students in the acquisition of, of content. And so, um, to directly answer your question, the answer is no. So if you remember one of the earlier budget documents from last year, we created, we through some reorganization at central office, uh, we had a co uh, communication position that ended up not making it through when we got to the end of the budget. And the idea, many districts have this in Massachusetts, and one of the challenges is that when it's an add-on to someone's job, um, the job gets done, and I think Ms. Figaro does an excellent job with that, and the challenge is there's, there's many, many other tasks that also have to get done that often are more time sensitive than communication, right? It's not that I, I'm looking at Mr. Donis, who does this for a living, I want to be sensitive that I think communication is critical, but it's also sometimes when there's a Corey check that comes in and someone needs to be in the next day and we want to make sure they're safe to be with kids, right? That's a, that's a hard calculus to manage. So um, I don't believe we're funding communication at the way in which, uh, in a perfect, not even a perfect world, the way we'd want to do it. Um, and I appreciate Ms. Figueroa's work on top of the other things she's doing, and Ms. Westmoreland as well, who does a tremendous amount, including the Friday update, which is, in my opinion, an aspect of communication. But uh, when I talk to other districts, and Ms. Figueroa and I, a couple years ago, were able to talk to another district, somewhere in the eastern part of the state, I think, who uh, had someone whose role was to, to do this, right, the responsiveness, um, the ability to think more proactively instead of like get really good stuff up quickly and, and make it look really nice but but not have like a you know kind of defined longer term strategy there is a difference there so i want to be honest in answering your question that you know for me the answer is no so what i want to do is i want to make sure that if uh, ms mcdonald Ms. castenson or mr sullivan have anything they want to add that they have an opportunity to do so Otherwise, we're going to move on, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <What? laughs> I, my, uh, oh, man. Um, every time licensure comes up, I just start sitting here and I start to fidget. I don't I bounce mm -hmm. out of my chair. And my face turns red and my stomach just churns and I get butterflies. And I just, um, at a district level, I don't understand how you, we were able to hire teachers that aren't licensed because having gone through the licensure program and I have an ELR account and no it's pounded into your head that your initial license is good for five years then you have to get your master's or if you don't already have it and then you work then you're the professional license and I just at the principal level and up I just don't understand how we haven't been on top of that before I can start if you like. You can start on them. Too. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I think a couple things. One is that some of these were inherited issues. Right. Um, yeah. But not all of them were. So I want to want to talk about some particular scenarios. And I don't want it to be so identifiable to a that's, particular staff no, that's member. What, right. That's why I didn't right. want to. Right. And Ms. Ortiz referred to it earlier. So sometimes there are situations where we have roles where we literally do not get one applicant who has all the licenses necessary for them. Uh, oftentimes that's related to special education right, right. where mm -hmm. that so uh, what we do is we hire who we think is the best person to have a license they may not have the multiple licenses they need for that role and this team supports them to receive that the licenses all the licenses they need so that um, at the end of this year they'll be fully licensed we also have situations where um, different MTELs come up so depending if you're grandfathered in or not there's you know the scenarios that were raised earlier around MTELs become a larger um, aspect or a larger part of the work, we have, um, I don't want to, I'm just trying to be, think about confidentiality. So we also have new licenses the state comes out with. So we have had teachers who are fully licensed and the state has now decided, well, there's a, I think this is fine to say, there's a computer science license. And now someone who's been teaching under the current license without any issues now is required to get a new license. And by the way, the regs come out just as, just before someone's supposed to actually get them. And how does actually one actually go through that process to get it? So when we talk about the reduction numbers of waivers, um, some of that's because either people got their licenses or they're not, they're no longer employed with us, and we have examples of that as well. And I want to be sensitive to that factor. But some of it's the structure that when we apply for waivers, it's because we don't have a licensed candidate for that role. They're few and far between, 
you know, we think about the number of staff members, the number of waivers that was applied for was six, uh, and some of those are actually resolved, or we won't need mm -hmm. to. They won't need to be on waivers because they've been able to been successful getting a license. Um, but that is more typically our situation. They're more typically involved in special education or related fields, and they need multiple licenses. Where we get lots of licensed candidates, but they don't have all the licenses they need for that particular role. So that'd be my in a nutshell. The nice thing about the SPED though is there's no MTEL. It's just the classwork. But there are MTELs that they would yeah. have to There's take. There's an MTEL for the... Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ms. Kastens or Ms. McDonald? You don't have to. I'm just going to give you make sure you had a chance. Thank you very much for this. And yeah, that's all I have to add. <laughs> thank you. Ms. McDonald? No, likewise, thank you. It's a comprehensive and um, very helpful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, pre I have my appreciation to it a lot. I think it's great. The, I think one of the things that um, I think building off of Mr. Sullivan's question is that um, what I was what I was hearing you describe, I thought, and I think, was both what your approach is around licensure, around ensuring that all the hiring entities are in the understands what their obligations are and what their responses mm -hmm. are. But also, my, my assumption had been that because you were focusing on um, circumstances under which you either had a deficiency in licenses held for people you are able to hire and get in, or also, I assumed in some cases, and I could be wrong about this, that you were, that this was in some way also connected to the developmental process of trying to improve hiring ladders within, or is that not the case? In this case, it may not be for this year. So most of it is what you initially said. Okay. Um, we look at people who are the best candidate, and if they have the one license, then yep. we work with them to get the second. Some of it was um, that we were still working with a couple of the um, candidates that we inherited okay. and are still just working through that. I'm sorry, the one thing I meant to mention, it's, it's a slightly non sequitur, but not uh, totally to Mr. Sullivan's comment, is the other thing that gets us into waiver world is we have high quality candidates who apply from out of state. So we are one of the unique states that is not part of, and this isn't a political statement, it's just the truth. We're not part of what's called the praxis. So most states mm -hmm. in the United States take the same licensure exam, and states can set their own passing mark. We have decided, and I've and this is something in my work on RIAC, the Racial Imbalance Advisory Committee, we've advocated with the commissioner. The new commissioner seems more amenable to having this conversation. We advocated with the old former commissioner around it, that it's a huge disadvantage for us when we get out-of-state candidates applying for Massachusetts because there's almost no way for them to get licensed uh, until they get here because we're not part of this national. So if we were in Connecticut, and Ms. Cunningham could tell you more details about Connecticut, but you, know, you have a practice score from North Carolina, well, does the score meet the cutoff for Connecticut? Great, then the licensure process is much smoother. And so for us, we do get a significant number of diverse candidates from out of state, and there are licensed teachers. They have work to do to become licensed in Massachusetts because we are unique in our licensing, licensing examination scheme. It sometimes takes time, and we do need to apply for waivers, and our commitment has been, while we can't offer reciprocity with other states, we're not also going to eliminate our way uh, one of the critical ways that we do diversify our staff, uh, as long as this, someone has a license from another state, we'll work with them to pass the MTEL. But most candidates don't have the license they need from Massachusetts at the time of hire because of our unique status. I'm oh, sorry, I know someone. I just want to add to what Dr. Morris said and um, say that sometimes our candidates have a license at maybe the uh, elementary level and they are hired at the secondary level or they have a license at the middle school level and they're moving up to the high school level and just need a moment to apply for the license at the next level. And so we would request a waiver to make sure that we're all licensed. Samina? How does a licensed out-of-state teacher get a license? Do they have to take a test? Yes. Right, so as in, in most states, um, they already have taken the test they would need. In Massachusetts, we have our own unique teacher licensure mm -hmm. test. So that no matter if they're licensed, have taught somewhere for 25 years, got a perfect score on the praxis, they mm -hmm. have to take the MTEL because they're moving that to Massachusetts. That could be a barrier. So it, 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 I mean, at a state level, it is a barrier. 
and a local level. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's why RIAC started to jump in. But that's why RIAC feels so strongly about this. They feel like it's a critical barrier to diversifying the teacher force in Massachusetts. Right. Right. Well, I was only going to add that even I, when I came here from Connecticut, I had to take the test here in Connecticut, even though I was uh, teaching for over, almost 20 years in Connecticut. Right. Th thank you so much, Bob. And also, I, I think the extended discussion at the end is helpful, just given all the conversation we had last year. <laughs> but I mean, I think one of the things I appreciate about it is just that um, through your answers, I think both what you and your team, as well as the superintendent, are um, evidencing is that you're that no, I'm not saying you weren't paying close attention to it but I'm saying you're showing great evidence of being on top of um, this subject now which is obviously something I think people should take great comfort in and pride in the work you're doing thank you great. thank you thank you, thank thank you. you. Mm -hmm. and be safe by the way we have any black ice out there or anything oh yeah I was going to say, this, yeah. be careful when you're driving home. I think it's been really wet out, and I understand it's colder. It's so, so, actually, when you, I was at one point wondering whether you were going to be here or whether there was. I got out of my truck. Okay, dude. I'm just saying. Uh, budget guidance. Can we take a five minute recess? Sure. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, actually, Ms. McDonald, is that okay with you? Yes, that's fine. Cassinson, is that okay with you? Yes, fine. Okay with me? Is that okay with you? It's okay with me. With it's you? It's okay with you? Say it out loud, Peter. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> they got done work. Thank you. That. So I'll introduce this slowly. Um, so budget guidance. Sure. So I can do a quick, and I think I shared this by electronically with the committee, yeah. that um, our process around budget guidance is typically that at the November meeting, the school committee talks about and, and hopefully votes a few discrete items for us to come back with at December meeting to provide more context and more information about in the budget process. I want to thank Mr. Mangano, who uh, shared electronically, and it's in the packet, just some key indicator reports. It really captures, uses the same format that the town of Amherst uh, does uh, in their financial um, presentations and, and makes it more specific to the schools with you know trends and some details and some financials at the bottom of the 12 slides that he shared so we're really open to feedback from the committee generally we like to say two to four areas because if we go much above that those of you who remember the lengthy meeting last December um, yeah. some of the feedback at the end was that was great and we want to not do probably as many areas because it, it Everything was great, but it went very late, and some of the feedback, as I recall, was um, it just got a little overwhelming, the, the content, uh, the amount of information. So, I don't know. It was if like a forced slog. Each individual item was fascinating, but the cumulative impact was like being bludgeoned with a hammer, as I recall. That's my polite way of putting it. <laughs> it was a tough year. Um, <laughs> um, and just to recap, um, or... Uh, refresh people who weren't part of the committee last year. So this process, that um, presentation, and then calling out some of these programs for sort of a deeper dive um, was the product of like a subgroup that sort of looked into the budget guidance process. I think um, Ms. Ordonez and Mr. Menino and somebody else, Mr. Nakajima, uh, looked at this process and developed sort of this approach to try to make it more meaningful. So um, we don't have to go over the slides. It's more just to update what you saw last year. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, and I'll take notes. So looking at these slides, I'm not sure if the input I have to provide is exactly what you're looking for. But I'll just give it anyway, and then you can tell me whether you can shelve it for something else. Um, so I was, I was thinking not necessarily in terms of like technical budget line items, but in terms of content areas. Mm -hmm. Like I think last year one of them was the um, was the sports offerings, mm -hmm. right? So I was thinking yeah. kind of along. Okay, good. So I'm not off the rails. All right. <laughs> so th the two things I was interested in in seeing is um, the first is is our performing arts, um, and, and I, th I think of this for, for a couple of reasons. One is so related to what we were sort of talking about earlier with communications. You know, we obviously spend a lot of time uh, talking about uh, PVC CICS Charter School because they're trying to expand. Uh, at the region, we actually spend quite a bit more on PVPA students, so local charter school that focuses on performing arts. Um, and I just happen to be lucky to have had three kids go through the schools, each of whom have had different experiences, different aspects of the arts from 7th through 12th, and just been constantly amazed at the breadth of offering 
the, the quality of our, um, of our faculty and, and the way at which it integrates with uh, students with special needs and, and in the classroom and how you know, there's, there's certain key events that bring everything, everything together. So um, the, the sort of roll up I would want to see from that from a budget perspective and um, this might involve like maybe the performing arts director or the, or the creative arts director uh, about you know what's what's sort of the state of the offerings for you know what one not just you know it would include like a list of like what we offer but also you know when you sort of uh, look for the next three to five years and, and the health of the program what is it that is going to be key um, to to support that so this could be you know middle school electives this could be equipment it could be staffing concerns uh, those, those sorts of aspects just a quick follow-up I think that's a good one and um one of the things I hear a lot is sort of the uh, the facility needs, you know, the auditorium seats. We've all sat in those. Those are not great for performances. Um, there's some lighting things that we've done recently, but I know there's more to do with lighting that I've heard from uh, Mr. Bechtold. Um, so I think we probably want to fold like the facility needs aspect of that into into it as well. Yeah. Um, so okay, so um, so that would be good. Um, I'd also want to give um, maybe Mr. Bechtold the opportunity to speak a little more broadly about. Um, because I know, uh, like sometimes in the middle school, uh, what's offered there can change depending on schedule constraints, and that's because that is one of the key grades at which parents and students make the choice to whether to continue on. Um, it's interesting, and it, it, I think about this in a budget perspective too, because of that that ROI, that cost benefit analysis. That you know, it's 18k a year for one kid, and if you're if you're say you're a communications position. Uh, if you retain one kid in seventh grade, that's potentially 18K times six years, right? Um, so that's one. Uh, if, and the other one is this sort of health and wellness theme that we've been talking about recently. This, this is sort of directly related to your superintendent draft goal number six. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of coming from a place that I, I don't have a great sense of what our health curriculum looks like right now and, and where where it's delivered, um, and this, this might vary whether you're talking middle school or high school, it might be advisory, it might be a quote-unquote health class, it might be part of some other class, um, and it could take a number of forms. Like, like when I grew up, health class was like taught by the teacher and it was a just say no to drugs and, you know, and abstain from sex. That was, that was what it was. Obviously, we have a much different and broader area of concern. In our community, you know, we have more progressive values, you know, we have, we have student leaders we're presenting on LGBTQ inclusion, um, the Sega Club uh, kids that went to New Jersey. Um, you know, we've, ta we've talked about technology and how it's how it's rapidly evolved and become part of our students' lives. How do they manage that interruption? Uh, the recreational drugs. You know, we have pot legal now across the river. You know, and so what what does that mean in terms of the the philosophy and approach of how we educate kids about uh, recreational drugs to not stigmatize it and yet not encourage it? How do we approach that. And there's some, some really interesting things there that may require budget investment. Um, you know, we, Canada has, has recently legalized, and I was looking into some of the, um, the things, and they spent a lot of time coming in to develop um, a modern curriculum of how do you talk to teens about, about drugs in a way that's, that's not a binary, you know, this is good or this is bad thing. Um, and, you know, there's other things in terms of emotional health, some of the issues we were brought talking about earlier um, even even late start times is something about the whole child you know the what affects the, the, the whole system um, and so so again that that general question of what are we doing now what would you like to do right so this is maybe both a superintendent and also a teacher kind of question um, and and what if any impact would there be, be to the budget um, not necessarily as much of a quantitative return on investment as the charter school you know loss um, is but but obviously a huge personal return on investment. Those are my two things. So here's what I'd like to do. I think I'd like to go down the committee uh, and just get people's thoughts. Um, I could either start in the end of the people who were not on the committee last year to go through this process. Why don't I do that, Ms. McDonald? And obviously, if you have any questions about this process, you can ask those too at the beginning. <laughs> um, excuse me, <laughs> bad timing. Um, the, I, I was actually going to ask if I could go later on, because mostly because of my lack of familiarity with this, this process. Um, I, hearing Mr. Demling's comments, that, that, that was helpful to sort of understand 
okay, what are we what are we trying to ask for and, and look for here? Because I look at these key indicators, which I, I love these charts and these reports, but they're um, a lot of them are things that are sort of beyond the control of you know of our our analysis. It's, it's more sort of understanding what are the influences and, and things coming in. But um, so I'd rather if, if if you can come back to me after other folks. No trouble. Of, no trouble at all. And actually, I, I, it's kind of a funny thing. We almost could have said at the beginning that the charts are actually unrelated to the question at hand. Um, because oh, okay. I think I think the I, mean, I, I know that sounds dumb because <clears throat> they're in there uh, and it, you'd think they'd be connected, but in fact the in fact the um, I think I'm getting this right, and if I don't have it right, Mr. Jornis can can um, change it to something that is right. Um, that the genesis of this was that um, we tend to start looking at the budget process in December January as a bunch of numbers and trends on a page, and it tended to be divorced from, a, unintentionally, uh, divorced from the question of um, how does this exercise of budgeting interrelate to the core mission goals that we have as a district, whether they are things like cons you know, counseling and support and services, or whether it's part of our, our curriculum and programming academically. And um, and we wanted to find a way in which we could have a more informed process to really dig into um, how our budget priorities are impacting the classroom. And also, since there's this sort of irritating part of budgeting where we never have enough money, and then we're thinking about, you know, oh, should we add 5000 or should we cut 5000 And then the question, we, we don't have, we, A, we don't have enough money anyway, and then B, well, what does that even relate to, right? Like, what are the impacts we're trying to shoot for in terms of the classroom, and what do we do now compared to what's happening two or three years from now? And so this was our, at least our attempt to try to improve that dialogue by picking substantive programmatic areas, and they could be directly academic in the classroom, but they don't have to be. They could be something elsewhere as a program area in the budget, um, whatever you think. Did I get that right, Mr. Dennis, basically? Yeah. Cool. So, Mr. Menino, now we're going to move the other direction and pick on you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can I just have one yeah. slight addendum? Not yeah, to be course. accepted, but just... Uh, so I think the only thing I'd add is that the slides that Mr. Mangano presented are likely not connected to what's cited here, but I don't want to preclude people from saying, I really want to dig in on health insurance, right? I see that chart, and it's a huge part of our budget, and we got an update last year. I'm not promoting that idea, yeah. but I also don't want to preclude committee members from saying, actually, I need more detailed information than what's on these charts on these things. So that's my two cents. It's obviously your decision, but um, I, I could imagine and in other committees, frankly, some of the feedback has been we yeah. want to dig in on this thing. It's not how the region has typically done it, but I, I don't think it'd be inappropriate for us to ask us to come back with it. No, that. I think the challenge is, I mean, if you look at all the slides, I mean, the challenge is Chapter 70 trends, regional transportation stuff. Right. Um, you know, I don't, I would it'd be a waste of time to talk about it. Even in my personal opinion, I guess I'm offering my opinion, yeah. even on like vocational and charter, there are other venues at our own meetings in which we talk about what those trends look like and whether there are things we should be doing that could positively impact those enrollment trends. I think health insurance and payroll are probably more uniquely suited to discussions on the board, but even, I mean, the committee, but even there, we just concluded negotiations on contracts. And so I'm not sure that on the, on the wage trends, there's as much that we can do functionally in that area. So, I mean, I think, yeah. that's not, so not sound funny about it, but I mean, even healthcare, since we spent a lot of time talking about healthcare last spring, and my God, there's only so much we can do there too. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I, just I don't make it sound like I'm arguing with you. I don't mean yeah. to be. I just mean I don't think I was totally out to lunch in my, in my comments. No, I, I didn't mean to, for you to feel that way. It's not what I was trying to I'm not, I'm not personally hurt. Good. But, we, but you, you have given Mr. Menino a little extra time to think about his answer. Because we talked about it earlier tonight, sport. Uh, what is the expenditure on sports and clubs? Uh, we mentioned that majority of students play at least one sport and club. Uh, what is the expenditure on sport above and beyond the uh, fees, the fees reimbursed? And 
I don't think this is part of the budget process, but I raised the question, what good is sports? <laughs> and somebody said, well, it's educational, it's empowering, it's uh, self-esteem, it's all kinds of other stuff. Uh, could that be addressed? So that was one that we actually did last year. So we did when you're talking one? about it, it might some of these maybe we could just resend out those presentations from last year because I think okay. um, there are a couple of good presentations on I clubs and athletics. Been that day. But it's a big one. Oh, I mean, it's you know the idea of of uh, academics versus sport or, 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 or performing arts. I mean, they're they're all kinds of intangible outputs. Uh, the output is in the class taught, or a sport taken. I just thought that. And because I've never participated in a sport, which is obvious, uh, <laughs> oh, I always looked down from afar, uh, like it to be discussed. But if it was if it's already covered, it we covered it. Mrs. Um So yeah, I just I wanted to uh, I guess state you know for what it's worth. I mean, looking at these charts were actually really helpful just to understand the trends. Um, and for me, that was what, what was happening with the transportation reimbursement, in particular in Chapter 7 day. Um, you know, we, we have taken, I think, a more active role in advocating on behalf of the schools, right, with our local and state elected leaders. Um, and that's actually, you know, was was heartening for a little while, and then things took a turn for the worse, right? Mr. Demling and I sat through several meetings with our local state elected reps. Um, so I think that, you know, beyond, as Mr. Nakajima says, sort of stating the obvious, you know, and, and marking those trends, there's not a lot that I would say about that. It's just really disappointing, and I think for us, you know, it's not a budget guidance question so much as where can the committee maybe lend some, you know, pressure and some expertise quote unquote, moving forward uh, in advocate, continuing to advocate, right? And maybe, you know, tapping the community a little more than we already have uh, to take action on some of these things and put some pressure, hopefully, where they where they are. I think it also will help that we have uh, new leaders in our government, both at, you know, our local level, but also at our state level, um, who hopefully have been hearing enough about this, uh, who ran on platforms that were connected directly to the importance of understanding Chapter 70 funding and, you know, regional transportation in particular, uh, but also just with things like charter schools and all of that, that, you know, they bring that awareness to Boston in this upcoming legislative year, and hopefully by next year we start to see some changes in that. Anyway, uh, I'll get off the soapbox for that. I think that, uh, you know, in terms of budget guidance, um, you know, a lot of the, the questions that keep coming up that I think you know, that we've con continued to grapple with as a committee have been particularly around issues related to diversity and, and related to equity. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's great to hear the uh, report from Ms. Cunningham tonight and from the superintendent uh, articulating our path forward in a lot of this and, and also stating, you know, we frankly could use some help, right? I and mean, that's what I'm hearing too, is that there's, you know, there's some room there for improvement and for growth. Um, so if we can look at ways of helping to to fund those things, and for all the reasons that I stated before, I mean, I think, you know, these these are values that our community holds, and I think, you know, for most of us, we are sort of on the same bandwidth in terms of understanding why these things are important, but it's also, practically speaking, about supporting our students and, you know, supporting our educators and helping them uh, be better students and better educators and better administrators, right? So ultimately, for me, practically speaking, it's about that. It's about giving them the skills and the mindset that they need to feel successful and to actually do a good job when they are here in school and, you know, to hopefully increase, you know, all of the things that we want to see, right, you know, from literacy rates to, you know, graduation rates to success in, in future careers, whether they go to college or otherwise. So I think all those things are important for us to continue and reflect in our budget. And I'm interested in doing that. I think, you know, specifically um, the, you know, restorative justice program I think is incredibly important. We're seeing some, this is sort of a, the blossoming of something that I'm, I'm hopeful uh, can actually make us, you know, uh, kind of stand out from the rest in terms of what we can offer our students in our community. This is, a, a, you know, extremely uh, difficult times that we're going through in our country, right? And we're seeing a lot of, you know, students expressing this frustration and hurt and difficulty dealing with a lot of the issues that are coming from, whether it's, you know, gender, you know, sexuality uh, concerns, whether it's, you know, race and ethnicity, immigration status, all of those things. 
and they have a real impact on their learning and also just in their success you know as as students and as community members so i want to see us doing better with that i think we, you know we we have already taken a, a position of saying we want to do better so what does that actually look like in you know this upcoming year um, i think that that's incredibly important and then you know i do think that thinking a little bit more also about some of our our core subjects um, you know, I, I raised a question before about you know math, and I, we're gonna, you know it's great to hear that we're going to be hearing more about that. Um, you know, I know that there's been some concerns raised by the community around you know some of our health classes and you know sort of what's what's uh, being taught there. I think any opportunities that we can take to continue to support all students, you know, through AP placements, uh, through you know just uh, you know better sex ed education, you know, um, different health, you know, uh, concerns and issues that we should take those opportunities to do that. So I think in terms of budget guidance, that's that's basically where I am right now. Um, I also understand that we are, you know, potentially in uncharted waters because we don't understand what the healthcare costs are gonna look like next year. You know, we've tried to stabilize that. We've done a pretty good job of it. Um, but, you know, it's still, it's still kind of a, a murky place, right? So, um, I do think it's important for us to stay on top of that and to continue to understand what's happening there and to, to you know, get more uh, you know, or frequent reports as we've been doing, uh, just to hear what's happening. Um, but you know, I do think as, as, you know, as far as the superintendent and our uh, you know, finance director can uh, articulate a path forward on these other things while still keeping this general environment mm -hmm. you know, in mind, um, that would be helpful. On um, the utilities, I don't need it blown out again, but I'm just curious, is that solar farm online in South Deerfield now? We're it, in the savings. Oh, cool. That took a little while. Four years. <laughs> and the other question, how are we doing on the um, natural gas? In what respect? Like, uh, and when we switch from oil and natural gas, are we still going to see some savings from the... Yeah. Um, so at the high school, middle school, um, natural gas, we actually are in the process of locking into a contract, which the rates are good, um, lower than what we were projecting. So that's been promising. Um, oil prices did come down, but they started to creep up a little bit again. So there's still uh, savings going to natural gas over oil. So I think for the region... Um, both schools being on natural gas has been a good thing if you look at it compared to our heating costs before we switched over. Thank you. Yep. Anything you want to hear about? In jumping on the curriculum bus, when we cut those two healthy programs last year and had to cut staff also, you kept under your breath mentioning that you hoped it wasn't, that you thought it could be worse the following year, which is I never wanted to ask you what that meant, so I, was, I stayed away from that question. I didn't want to hear the answer, but now I think it's time to hear if we're going to have to do the same thing again. So I think we'll talk about this in the next agenda item um, a little more specifically, if that's okay with Sam Sullivan. Me? Yeah. So uh, I would like to endorse what Mr. Demling's interest in hearing about uh, wellness. I, I, I like the I like yeah. the arts thing too, but <laughs> but, but uh, and and what I would love I don't I guess I guess the truth is I would be happy for you to present that in whatever manner you, your your staff your team would naturally present it. And what I mean by that is to me, my assumption is um, if you're impacting the entire student body. Then that conversation, that that the, your methodology, could go anywhere from actual counseling and support for people who need it, uh, you don't really need it, straight through ac more academic settings, in which you're engaging a broad population, in which you may not have any particular. <laughs> like if you have 20 kids in a room, you don't have any particular reason to know any of them have any issues, but you're still wanting to engage them and familiarize them with general principles of wellness and whatever um, modality you're doing it. So I, my point is I'm opening it up to the question of what's, what, how would you present that conversation around how you're attacking it? I guess my assumption is that there's more than one way to do it. Uh, that actually, more than one way you need to do it in order to be effective. Um, 
The other thing I would like to hear about is if this year we're doing a strategic plan, um, that means next year we're going to be implementing it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what resources we need or that we think we have or what our perspective is on being able to support um, the implementation of that plan. And so to me, that could mean a number of things. That could mean looking at materials and professional development days and how they're allocated. It could actually mean things like communications because if you got a plan, not only do people need to know about it, but also you still need to have the interactivity of that's an ongoing process. And then um, it seems like, speaking of defunct or maybe defunct or not defunct subcommittees, um, you know, we we endlessly seem to have had conversations around data and identifying data sources and managing them and analyzing them and making them, you know, transparent. And I, I say I say I introduce that t that topic in sort of a vague way because um, I could understand if you would say, well, we don't have money to appropriately resource these areas. What's the guidance you give me, Eric? You're saying you want to put a lot of money into it? Uh, and then that would sound stupid, and maybe even more stupid when we get to the next but item on the agenda, right? And so I'm not trying to say it in that bounded way. I'm just saying if you're going to bother developing a strategic plan, then we have to think about how we're going to implement it. And that almost certainly either has, it has resource implications under any circumstance, meaning if there's no net increase anywhere, then someone's still going to have to be doing work that's allocated towards some aspect of implementation. Or it means there is an ad or a shift, right? And so getting an understanding of that thinking would be useful. And then I want to drill down specifically into the question of where we think there might be resource needs. And then I specifically do have a question around data. Um, and part of it is just because, again, if we don't think we can do a budget ad and it's just not realistic to do, then we need to answer for ourselves the question of, well, how are we thinking of being able to develop, monitor, and analyze the data over and, and publicly share data over time that's going to be instrumental in creating both consensus as well as momentum around those plans? And I, by the way, I don't have any answers. This is the great thing about asking these questions. Is I can just ask the questions, and then you guys can provide the answers, and you know, I'll try not to peanut gallery it. <laughs> Skazinson. Um, all right. When I came in, I was going to ask about athletics, but we don't need to ask about that. And I thought about that specifically because of all the capital um, improvements that we're wanting to do. Um, I think performing arts would also be a great area, as would wellness, which brings. I do think that for me, one of the most important things is tying. Um, the budget guidance to the goals because that's what you know we've that is our um, our vision for the district and so those things are really <coughs> so um, there's certain right with regard to the restorative justice and a lot of this I mean I think I have questions about what um, yeah what parts of the budget would play into that so maybe a little more information um, the wellness goal that's been brought because that is a goal um, I know we mentioned at our last meeting particularly regarding the new landscape of recreational marijuana that's coming into Amherst, of what the school committee in the district could do to just be a more active part in that and helping in that process and that conversation. So I think, yeah, the well, that, that fits into the wellness yeah. goal and budget guidance. Um, my last, this is more of a question. I mean, I this is budget guidance. I don't know if we do sort of budget look back because, I mean, looking through these, you know, there are trends. Um, Charter school tuition is going down, choice tuition is going down, that's a percentage. I don't know if that means that we're spending more and those things are sort of staying level or if they're actually, we're spending less. But if we are, um, what have we done to to um, increase that retention rate? And can we sort of look at it from a critical way to see, to keep up the good work? Um, and what would we do next? Yeah. Can I ask a question, by the way? Can you actually, it might be helpful to the committee, where does this meeting fit within the budget process? Near like the beginning. Another meeting in a couple of weeks. What are we doing then? Um, so, 
this is probably the, I think the first time we've officially talked about the budget guidance. Um, so there was sort of a three-pronged approach that the subgroup came up with last time. So there was the indicators, which you have. There's this meeting, which either next month or the month after, we'll have the groups come and report back to you. Um, and then the third part was actually um, what, what you mentioned, Ms. Kasten sent about the goals and um, tying the, how does this current budget support the goals that the superintendent's laying out. Um, so this is near the beginning. I think we're sort of on trackish. Um, one of the things, I think we're still sort of feeling out the Amherst budget process this year with the, the switch over. Um, it does have an impact on the region. I think things are going to move pretty much the same way as they have in the past, but um, you know, we're still going to have to fill out that new process with a town council as opposed to a town meeting. Um, the Amherst always was at the end before. I don't know if that's still going to be the process. Um, but I think we're on track in terms of the budget process. Um, the, you'll see initial sort of um, projections of numbers at the four town meeting on December 8th. So that'll be sort of your first glance at what the rough gap would look like for um, next year. So um, we're on track. The reason I, w I wanted to... Oh, no. Uh, uh, please. No, the reason I was going to say the reason I wanted you to say what you just said, mm -hmm. is that um, based on what you just said, Ms. Kastensen, absent that information, this would look um, woefully inadequate to begin a conversation sure. around our budget, what our trends are, what our look back is, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in, in even though I think we're, I'm sure we're fine in terms of the, where we are in the schedule, I think last year we did this probably a couple weeks earlier. Yeah, I think we started, you know, we, I think we tried to start in October last year, but, you right. know, given the No, but the I'm just, the reason I'm just saying that is that yeah. if we were having this conversation two or three weeks ago, the sort of preliminary nature of the conversation would feel more natural. Coming up on, like, you kind of see December in sight, it starts feeling more like, mm -hmm. hey, we're, we're moving towards making decisions yeah. at some point. And it'll get much more granular, much faster, and a lot more information. Yep. So I'd, uh, just three comments. One is just the raw numbers in the bottom of these charts mm -hmm. uh, as well. So, okay. you know, the percentage is, on, is the red line, oh, okay. but yeah. the raw numbers yeah. are, are included. I think the second thing, um, and again, I think we talked about this a bit more last year and two years ago uh, around some of the trends. We did a survey um, about for charter choice and... Um, private school families and uh, one of the things that that I noted at the time and is still true now is that there are these key touchstone moments in the district and I was surprised because I've been in the district a while how many people commented on um, challenging moments in the district and and just how that made them think about other choices more favorably and and so I do think you know this is gonna be a weird thing to say but I do think the committee has had a large role in um, promoting a healthy working relationship with the community. And I do think there's a place of, of having that stability and forward movement that has made an impact on some of the areas that you cited. And I think we saw, I saw evidence because I saw the raw data before it got scrubbed of some of the, I didn't like when, and you know, people's names were used, so that wasn't released publicly. So I do think there's a lot of reasons why, but I do, but it's my belief that the data showed that, that that's one of them. Um, I think the last thing I want to say is a number of people have mentioned well, it's going you know, concerns about talking about potential budget ads in what may or may not be a challenging budget year. And I, I actually think there's more reason to actually talk about them. You know, we added the restorative practices position in a bad budget year. We added Chinese last year in a terrible budget year. So I do, I mean, it was a small amount of Chinese, but we did do that. So I don't, you know, just, I, did, I appreciate the sense of concern about where our budget sits and, and you know, fiscal conservative approach about that. At the same time, um, I think before we get real numbers, before we have a four-town meeting, and even after the first one, um, I think if there's things the committee feels urgency about for the district, I, I, I don't, I don't know. It sounds weird, but I just don't want people to have to feel apologetic about saying I think there may be a need here, and um, and you know we can work on it. I'm not saying we can deliver on it. There's a lot of variables, but it also helps us when we talk to our constituents, and you know, and me for it's mostly staff and some parents, but you. Uh, in your different roles to say these are the types of things that we're fighting for, you know, that we feel like our community needs and uh, not be in the kind of deficit mentality of cuts. So uh, for what it's worth, I just, I noticed a couple of people very respectfully saying that and, and I, there's no critique of it. It's actually just, I'd rather actually have that stuff on the table so when we have those conversations, it's out there instead of, um, you know, withholding. I think at least for myself, yeah. the reason I mentioned it a couple of times is that since all of our meetings are kind of public dialogues. 
um, I didn't really feel like having a conversation in which a very reasonable public critique would be you spend a half an hour talking about multi-hundred thousand dollar ads in an environment in which there's no sense of where the money's coming from. Absolutely. And it is, otherwise it seems utterly divorced from reality. Yeah. And so I preferred to talk more about tasks that we need to get, like on the strategic planning stuff. Yeah. If we don't have an answer to how we're thinking about implementing it and monitoring how we're implementing it and doing that, that's a bad answer whether there's a budget ad or not. That's right. And so, you know, rather like same thing with wellness and legal marijuana and stuff, right? Ms. McDonald, we're catching up to you. <laughs> I'm always coughing as soon as I start talking. Um, so I would um, uh, endorse the um, and sort of add my voice to some of the areas that others have mentioned, including the performing arts. Um, I haven't seen the sports um, uh, in the past, so I would love to, if, if it's you know, just repurposing something from the past, I'd love to see that. And wellness, so I'll just add my voice to those. I did have... One quick clarifying question um, on the on the, the budget indicators, um, and then um, another question. And I don't know if it's appropriate for what we're talking about now. But my clarifying question is the wages and benefits. And there's a comment that it's that increase um, 17 to 18 is health insurance costs. Can I? It, does that mean that the next page that that health insurance cost spending is actually a subset of that first chart? Yes. Okay. Um, so it looks like there's some increase also um, in 18 beyond just the health insurance cost. So I would be curious, and this kind of leads into my next question, um, be curious to understand sort of what's driving the rest of those increases beyond the health insurance, because it looks like it's still about three or 400,000. In my doing the math in my head, but um, my and my question is: is some of the things is I I um, am intrigued and curious about the, the conversation that um, Mr. Nakajima brought up about data because it does come up repeatedly, um, and then it kind of links also with somewhat into communication and strategic planning. But data is is important, and if it's just one bullet point on the gazillion things that are fabulous HR department is doing, um, is there opportunity, and I don't know to what extent, and I, being absolutely new to this, I apologize, but to what extent um, consultants or short-term contract positions are, are used and leveraged for some of these, um, these kinds of non-curricular, um, non-sort of completely ongoing um, you know, administrative leadership positions such as data, data crunch, data analysis, or even even bringing in some of the you know web website maintenance and um, um, you know just communications maintenance, if you will. So those are you know I don't know to what extent those fold into that wages and benefits and the but understanding sort of the full time versus temporary contract and consultant and to what extent we use and, and leverage um, those sort of one-off opportunities to get work done, basically, that we can't really envision bringing on a full-time position for. So I can start if you are. You want to start? Yeah, I think on the wages piece, I'll I can bring back more information next time. I mean, some of that's just the um, the regular step and call that all staff get every year, um, but there's probably a little okay. bit more information to go with that. Um, and then on the contracted piece, so that's not obviously included in the, the wages piece. Um, I'm trying to think if we have any types of contracts. I know we have done one like that in the past. I'm thinking the U Chicago yeah. thing we did a few years ago, but um, I don't think we have any currently. So we do contract with the collaborative who do support us with the website development. Um, and they do you know some of the setup and the core kind of technical features. Um, but I think, yeah, I agree with Mr. Mangano. I don't think we have thought of contracting out. And some of it, when it gets the data and student data, that gets really sort of complicated with student rights and privacy. I and mean, you can sign down disclosure, but we tend to be quite sensitive about what we do with student data um, because there's no way to crunch it without having some identifiable piece unless we put up protocols that end up being more cost than that. Like, you know, for a consultant to do the work, it, it 
tends right. to be quite costly. Um, but certainly something we could come back to for future dialogue and conversation if the committee would like. Great, thanks. Um, we're going to move on. We have a busy agenda. We have a lot more to do. Yeah. So should should we use sort of our judgment and pick somehow roll these together um, to bring back to you? Yes. Okay. So if we don't get to all of them, that's okay. I mean, there's themes of what we've heard. We may not be able to get to all of them sort of in that one type of meeting, um, but we'll do our best to address as many as we can. Okay, I'll ask my question. What next, what do you plan to bring back to us? For this? For, for all these concerns have been mentioned, performing arts, wellness. Yeah, so uh, for performing sport. arts, <laughs> we'll have um, Mr. Bechtold, who runs the performing arts program, um, come and speak to you about what he does, all the offerings, the challenges that he faces sort of from a um, supply facility standpoint, um, and then address your questions. You, you know, you'll have deeper questions that you'll want to go into when you hear that presentation, and, and he'll, so it'll give you a better understanding of the performing arts program. So when you see what it costs, and if there's a, you know, ad, or if you want to add funds, you'll have a better uh, context for hearing that. Great. Oh, I sit down. Uh, you're not sitting down. Good, smart man. Uh, regional assessment, four town meeting discussion. Yeah, so the four town meeting is December 8th, I want to say, Saturday morning, um, upstairs in the library, um, the middle school, and we're hoping everyone can attend. And they're critical for those of you, I'm just going to say it out loud for those people who may not have been at four town meetings. There are opportunities for this in the past, I have to amend it a little for Amherst now, but in the past has been Select Board Finance Committee. Uh, school committee to come together to hear about the financial uh, condition of the schools, talk about the year going forward, uh, talk about assessment methodology and, and financial overview uh, and outlook. And so they've been critical meetings around the four towns coming together to align um, the four towns, the needs of each town and trying to figure out how to fund the regional school district, um, both operational and capital budgets. In this particular year, and I'll start and you can jump in, but I think, um, you know, what we're planning to present um, is multiple budget scenarios. So just going back to last year, you might remember that we, the agreement between the four towns was to have 20% of the statutory method um, uh, rolled in. So that happened last year. There was not agreement between the four towns on what was to happen this year. Some towns assumed that would go up to 40%. It was a five-year roll in straight to going to statutory. Other towns uh, openly stated that they did not agree with that approach. Uh, we've gotten uh, budget guidance from two of the communities. Amherst has given us a 2.5% increase as budget guidance, and Leverett has given 1.5% as budget guidance. Um, and as you all know, that there's a relational formula. So those two things don't necessarily mean that the the um, one and a half percent in one town doesn't mean two and a half percent in another town because they're in relation. So I'll, I'll no, go ahead. I mean, they both can't be true most of the time. Yes. A hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Um, and, yeah oh, no, go, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, I went to a Leverett Finance Committee meeting, so we got the guidance from them. They are in another tough sort of financial year. So the one and a half, you know, there were talks of going to two. They settled on one and a half because they do have um, some significant financial hurdles that they have to deal with this year. Um, Another wrinkle this year that may, you know, I welcome your input on in terms of designing the presentation. It's going to be a little bit of a different dynamic because we're going to have 13 town councilors, um, some of which this is going to be brand new for. You know, this was sort of, we had the same select board members for a long time. They're very well versed in this. Now we're going to have 13 councilors, some of which have experience, some of which this is going to be brand new. Um, so designing that presentation or, or trying to bring up to speed sort of on that will be you know, I'm open to your suggestions on what we should think about for that. Um, but yeah, we're going to design that presentation to show uh, multiple options, the 20%, the 40%. You know, what if we hit Amherst guidance? What if we hit Leverett guidance? Um, and we'll be open to feedback from the towns if there's other things they want to consider. Do you um, expect to get guidance from Shutesbury and Pelham before then? Um, Pelham doesn't give formal guidance to us specifically, but they sort of have a running guidance of 2.5%. Um, sort of just sort of what they want us to stay within to be sustainable long term. So you kind of feel like you already have that guidance then? Yeah. So what about uh, Shootsbury? Um, Shootsbury has not issued us formal guidance the last few years. Uh, I have called uh, their town administrator just to check in, see how things are going, um, but we haven't received formal guidance from them for a few years. 
And I just want to put perhaps a finer point on, on that one of the critiques in the past has been the presentations have been hinged, you know, uh, or the models that have been shown always assume that Amherst guidance, the town of Amherst guidance, dictates the other three. Now, in reality, it doesn't work that way, but um, since they give formal guidance, we've done that. And we're trying to be responsive to that feedback by showing multiple scenarios with the towns we have formal guidance from and what it would do to all four towns so that it's going to be a longer presentation with more models but we think it's responsive to make sure that we're being fair to all the communities that's a stupid question i know it's a stupid question but i don't really care um what would happen if you built a budget that included a two and a half percent increase from palom a two and a half percent increase from amherst a one and a half percent increase from leverett and whatever two the heck and that half, would mean. Two and a half. And two and a half from Shootsbury. What would that look like? I mean, is that even, that, presumably that's not actually mathematically impossible to calculate. Right, it's not mathematically impossible. The, the I don't know if it's a long-term thing. So you have to, in your regional agreement, mm -hmm. you have to have some sort of method. So if, as a one-year solution, something like that's possible. I, you'd have to think about how to write the amendment to the regional agreement, but um, that's not impossible. They actually did that for a few years. They had like equal increases every year to all okay. four towns. Um, but long term, the regional agreement needs some sort of method. But I don't um, even care if out. it's equal. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying yeah. is, yeah. If, what I'm saying is, is if Shutesbury, Pelham, and Amherst all say two and a half, and Leverett, for whatever peculiarity of their financial circumstances, say one and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, let me put it this way. Let me, let me rephrase what I'm saying. One of your slides should show that. Sure, yeah, we can do and that. And the reason I'm saying this, I'm going to be very blunt, because we've already gone through this a couple of years now, and certainly last year. Um, I, I don't know what that would show, but for the sake of argument, if 2.5% increases in three towns and 1.5% increase in the other town meant we didn't have to cut our budget sure. and we could actually meet our needs without going through some ghastly experience this coming year, it's important to ground ourselves in showing that, that basically the rest of the argument on what the formula is, if all the towns are agreeing, if they did, sure. that they would be willing to pay those increases, then I'd like to see what that looks like mm -hmm. on paper to understand whether that would be enough to meet our needs. It might not. It might actually mean with you know all the other increases we have, it might still put us slightly underwater or might be treading water. Maybe I don't know what it would show. You guys sure. will do the analysis. Yeah. But I would love to have that starting point because I understand the idea that creating different, adopting different formulas has flowed in implications from one town to another. But there's really been two parallel exercises we've been going through in the last couple of years. One has been what formula it feels or is fair and should we adopt philosophically. The other one is how do we pay for our, our school budget, right? Mm -hmm. And that those two have interwoven in a way that I think is very unhealthy, is that we can contemplate in circumstances that we need to cut our budget, but in fact, if you pop back for a second from a broader perspective and say, well, wait a minute, what's everyone said they're willing to pay? Oh, well, the willingness to pay actually would meet our needs. Well, then why the hell are we cutting our budget, right? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's sort of an unreality to that exercise. And so at, at the very, and I, and I understand why it's not exactly unreal. Sure. There is a statute around this. There are guidances around the, for, whatever. But I'm just saying one of those, one of those slides should show that. And by the way, if it shows we're underwater anyway, then that would should even be more bracing that when we're looking around at these different formulas. Um, anyways, whatever. I'll stop there. Is there a donut? Is it Mr. Dimley? Sure. Okay. I see your hand. Maybe you went up first. I don't know. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think having sat through, I think maybe three of these meetings so f in the past few years, um, it's become really apparent that I think you know, we have very different perspectives on this this process and how this process should be run. And even I think at the end of the day, I think everyone that's in that room is, you know more or less on the same page in saying we want to make sure that our schools are well funded and that we're doing the best that we can for our kids. That said, I also think that there's so many different competing uh, perspectives and interests that we end up sort of talking at each other and my experience has been that we've actually just come up with these sort of uh, stopgap solutions to, you know, just stop stop the, the water from flowing through the dam, you know, mm -hmm. too quickly, right? Like, let's just, you know, try to mitigate to the best of our ability. 
uh, some of the rea financial realities of, of these you know, different towns, these different communities. Um, and that doesn't get us at a long-term process. It doesn't help us you know, have uh, you know, beneficial conversations, I guess, in the long term, right? Because we're constantly saying, okay, well, you know, we'll negotiating during the process. And I think that that, that can be healthy, but it also makes it a lot harder for the district to yep. be able to plan in the long term because yep. you, you never know what's going to happen from year to year. We're always back in this conversation of like, okay, well, now we have to go to this, you know, four town meeting and hope for the best, right? And, you know, and do our best to negotiate. And so, you know, I think in laying out the framework, what I'm most interested in hearing is a, you know, a kind of a, a almost like a, a review to refocus everybody. Like, you know, can, can we at least agree that we want to work towards making sure that our schools are the absolute best schools that they can be and that we are committed to the mission and the values of, of our school district and start from there, right? Like it's almost like, you know, uh, bringing everybody back to what's important and saying, let's have that conversation first. I don't want to dwell on it because I'm not a Pollyanna, you know, mm -hmm. kind of person. Like I don't think it's, it's worthwhile to delve too deeply into something like that. But I do think it might help, hopefully, some of the psychology of the people that are in the room. Like just thinking about, you know, this is the reason why we're having this conversation is because we're actually trying to benefit the health, long-term financial health and stability of our school district which we all happen to be invested in, literally. So um, can we think about you know, presenting that first and then mm -hmm. think about how do we come to a conversation about you know, what, what does it take to actually get there, right? Like, you know, let's have a, an, a frank conversation about what's involved in all of this. And do we feel like, you know, I, don't, I haven't gotten a sense since last year that there's been any movement in, in feeling from the different communities about, you know, yes, we are willing to, to pay a little bit more or we're willing to, you know, we've sort of, aside from what you just described with Leverett, um, I haven't heard anything else from any of the other communities, right? You know, obviously here in Amherst is different. So, you know, is there an opportunity for us to, to have a conversation that feels a little bit more collaborative as opposed to just people, you know, getting pitted against each other and, or feeling that way anyway, right? Like, you know, we're going to pay more, but we're not doing that next year because we paid so much this year, you know? It just feels like it's not contributing at all to the long-term health of that. Um, so I think it just, I think we need to think a little bit about framing. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that it was actually, in my, from my perspective, uh, helpful to have the school committee play a prominent role in mm -hmm. the meeting last year. Um, years prior, the tenor of the conversation was actually very different. It felt mm -hmm. a lot more like sort of, you know, there was a little bit more tension and animosity about, you know, sort of being there, having the school committee kind of at the front of the room, you know, having the chair there, uh, playing a central role in, managing the conversation seemed to feel, and I don't know if Dr. Morris and Mr. Rangano agree, but it, you know, it felt to me anyway like it was really important to do that. Mm -hmm. you can, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's right, and I think that conversation probably should take place before we show people numbers. Mm -hmm. um, if we really want people to have that conversation sort of without having that sort of filter first, because um, once we show them options and they see, then it's sort of lost. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and I would just to, to the point of school committee involvement, absolutely, and, and I think um, a line that Mr. Mangano and I try to to stay clear of is that while we're advocating for the schools, um, and, at, and at times, and I'm glad you mentioned last year because it felt better last year, but at times, you know, I, we've spoken and, and we felt like we've gotten pushed into conversations uh, and we have to be careful not to be, we're not representatives of any town, we're representatives of the region. So we're actively looking for school committee members to play large roles, not just in the, you know, and Mr. Duncan Jr. did a great job last year in terms of facilitation, but even when we go into small groups. Um, because, you know, we're interested in the health of the district and in the UR as well, but we also are not, we can't be advocates of, well, this method goes, you know, and just maybe taking a step back for people who haven't been through it. So the school committee recommends a method and a budget and that's what goes to the four towns, whether it passes or fails, um, as opposed to a town budget, which is slightly different in how that, how it functions, where it's just sort of a dollar, a, a dollar amount gets voted and goes to the town. This one, both the assessment methodology and the budget number, uh, numbers go to the towns for a vote. And so uh, we are actively looking for, um, 
firm involvement from committee members, you know, both at the front end, which we can, I think, simulate last year, and I think that was successful, but also in the small groups, um, because you're, you're the collective body that's going to end up voting on these, and we look to you to advocate and help uh, towns come to that conclusion, and, and I think the feedback's good on the framing, and we can certainly do that um, as well in terms of the front end of the meeting. So to make this, me our current meeting, efficient, <laughs> you're going to go to Mr. Demling, but then after him, I want to just go around the table and get people's feedback or input on this, or questions, it could be anything, so that we could um, move through this item productively. Show me. Yeah, so just to comment on a couple of ideas that are brought up in terms of what might make this more most efficient. Um, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think about it that deeply until Ms. Ordani has brought this idea up, that we're trying to do two things at the same time. One is get through the crisis or well, what always feels like a crisis of the current budget year. My gosh, we need everybody to agree on something, please. And then by the skin of our teeth getting out and yay, we did it. And then having to do the whole thing over again. So, um, and so not wanting to spend so much time on just getting agreement on a one year without paying any attention to a long-term solution. Um, and yet I feel it's a bit of a paradox because I, I feel like it, um, until we settle the, the one year, like the current budget year, that there is that natural defensiveness. I mean, if, if Leverett is coming and saying 1.5% and we're firm on that and we actually have a hard budget year, I, I can't see an unclenching of that concern that's right in front of them to, in order to talk more broadly about, you know, what they value in schools and what the three to five year priority is. Um, so, so I was really intrigued by Mr. Nakajima's idea of, well, why not just show the guidance that every town has come with and say, this is, um, th th this is a model. And, and who knows, maybe politically it, it won't fly. But it, it would at least show that we're honoring and respecting where towns have said that they're coming from, right? Because there's so much, I mean, I've only been involved in this process for two years, but there's so much bad blood in some respects with, uh, and, and history here uh, that the, the level of mistrust is pretty high <laughs> coming in. And there's so many people at these meetings that the potential for real open, back and forth, understanding, dialogue, changing of minds is, is pretty low in that, in that context. Um, so, so, so I, I kind of feel like um, starting from a position where we're, we're not attacking each other, we're saying, okay, you've said 1.5%, you've said 2.5%, you said this is what it looks like. If, if we were ever able to get to a point where, where that budget looked manageable, we could then, that would, that would take care of that, it's, it's off the mind, and then we could start thinking about, about long term and, you know, are, are we going to go to 40% statutory and, and whatnot. I just, I just feel like that second conversation is so hard to have when there's so much protection over an individual budget. Um, and, and in terms of process, I, I do agree that I, I liked when um, Mr. Nakajima, you and um, uh, Ms. Kosensky were at the front of the table and directing that, I thought it was a good thing. Um, and I, I also, I think, and um, the, the variable this year, uh, the new variable of the town council coming in, m maybe presents an opportunity to, to even clarify that process because you kind of have the built-in excuse of here's, you know, up to 13 people that are completely new to the process. And so it makes sense that you would say, well, what are we doing here? We're the regional school committee and we recommend a, a method and a budget. And, you know, and so we're here to get your feedback on that. And you, so you sort of lay out for the newbies, right, what the expectations are. And that sort of implies to the rest of the group of what we are actually doing. And so this is how we're going to proceed. We're going to do item A and then item B. And Mr. McGowan is going to present this information and then we'll... So there might be and an I, opportunity think, to the improve way, that process. Yeah, and I think, by the way, for 11 out of 13 of those town councilors, they are actually literally going to be new to at least the last couple of years of four town meetings. So I think there's a huge, huge, huge mm -hmm. majority who are like that in that position. Interesting. Mr. Menino, we're going to move around the table. I'll wait for the political forces to play themselves out in terms of what each town is willing to pay. I don't anticipate a long-term solution ever unless we move to the all statutory method, which I guess would be a long-term solution. Okay. It's a political process. Mr. Sullivan? I have nothing to add to this. Yes, um, I've been to some four town meetings before, not last year, so I just uh yeah, so I think having the school committee taking a bigger role sounds great. It's been helpful for me to be on this side of the table since I've never been, um, yeah, I've just attended but haven't been a part of the process. Is it fun? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it, I, yeah. Because welcome to this side of the table. I appreciate yeah. the, the perspective, though, from all of you who've spoken, so thank you. That's all I'm just saying. Ms. McDonald? Uh, um, I, I don't have anything to add. Okay. My only, the only thing I'd add, um, again, on it is, like, and I don't know if I said it right earlier, um, or said what I was thinking earlier, is, and actually, I think it'd be helpful. I don't know if you could, but if you could do an analysis of what the budget would look like um, and set, share it with this committee uh, in advance of the four town meeting, I'd kind of actually appreciate it because um, I don't honestly, <laughs> like I, like in your head, do you have a sense of whether that gets us anywhere close to yeah, what I our think, budget needs are going to be? I think what? that will be a uh, advantageous method for the region for one year. My concern is that it's not tied to sort of a... No, 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 no. Oh. That's not a question I'm asking. Yeah. I'm just saying, you, so you, a, a, you think you could work out that math and show it to the committee? Absolutely, but I just want to finish two, that one point. And two, yeah. you think it might actually be a decent status quo budget in terms of the numbers? Yeah, I do. Um, but the, the one piece is just for the next year when you, if, say we try to apply a logic, yeah. the more you sort of have a method that is not based on a logic, the yeah. farther you have to go to get back to something. Um, so that, that's just the one sort of pitfall to keep in mind, that if, if we just say we increase everybody, you know, X percent, the next year you say, no, we're going to tie to enrollment, it, that means somebody's going to probably have a bigger um, adjustment period yeah. to, to go through. I understand that, but I mean, I guess part of why I really want, A, to see the numbers mm -hmm. so yep. we know what it looks like, and then B, to potentially have that as part of the conversation we're having with the four towns, is, uh, in my personal view, we're, we're in a really unhealthy place with this conversation where it is conceivable that we might actually, and again, that's why I want to see the math, sure. is it's conceivable that all four towns might be willing to pay what we need to to maintain our budget, but will choose not to and will force us to make cuts because we can't agree on a formula on a page that would get us in their minds to fairly pay what they've already said they're willing to pay. And, I'm, and that sound, may sound a little silly, but the, what I'm backing that away from is the idea is that I would argue that one of the principles I would like to follow is that we're not gonna butcher our budget or cut it um, for basically no good reason. And I'm sorry to put it that way, and that, that if, if I'm not gonna say this at the four time meeting, I know this is on camera, but I mean, if, if I said it at the four time meeting, people would yell at me and say, it's not for no good reason, it's actually for excellent principles, and here are all the principles. The, so that's probably too extreme on my part. So if I, if I dial it back a little, uh, what I would argue is maintaining a stable budget environment that's predictable and is able to provide, retain staff, and retain a level of quality services that we think we need for the best interest of our district is in fact in a really important value along with having predictability and fairness around whatever methodology we're assessing towns. And, and even though I know at the end of the conversation we had with the four towns, there was near unanimity, not unanimity, but near unanimity, that, um, you know, that that was really important and that towns were committing themselves to say, we want to make sure that the resources are there. Um, I almost want to front load that on the conversation and say, look, based on what you've all said you're willing to pay, it would get us to this budget. Now, I recognize that that doesn't change the obligation to figure out a long-term solution, but it is an equal and important principle, and I would argue more important principle, to say that we should have a, that if there's no reason to do harm, like massive increases in our healthcare expenditures or whatever, why are we, right? Like, let's, there should be a do no harm principle around creating continuity in our budget. If you have a huge recession and revenues are falling off a cliff and state aid is being dramatically cut, which could happen. Yeah. It's happened before. It could certainly happen again. Then you're making decisions that you simply can't avoid and have to make because there's no way the town, which is also under duress, towns that are also under duress, can ever make up the shortfall on budget. And so you're forced to make budgetary decisions that are really gruesome, but also absolutely necessary because the money's not going to come from anywhere, right? In an environment in which you're not faced with that circumstance, then there should be a prudential principle that the towns follow around trying to come to an agreement 
that doesn't unduly harm the operating budget while also finding a pathway. And I think the conversation, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm lecturing anyone, throwing that out, mm -hmm. but it makes absolutely no sense to start from a framework of abstract principle and abstract ratios and say, where, where do we want to end up on these abstract ratios? When in fact, some of them are going to do, could do undoubtedly significant harm to our operating budget. And, and again, if you start with the budget guidances, that'll tell you up front, where are, we, where are we actually in terms of the ability of the towns to pay? Now, how do we get there in terms of what the ratio should look like? So I know that was long, but, I mean, this is, this, but the reality is we don't need another working group because another working group is not going not gonna to succeed. And so if that's not going to succeed, then what's really the goal of the school committee, in my opinion? The goal of the school committee is to ensure we have the resources we need to be able to support the budget, knowing the fiscal picture of the towns. What gets us there? Let's figure that out. Sorry. Two very brief comments. So one, you know, just thank, thank you all for the conversation because this is the kind of feedback we were looking for is, you know, what kind of presentation, how to model it, how to frame it. Um, that's the reason we put it on the agenda for today is, you know, we haven't always had meetings to talk about Fort Town meeting before it happens. This was really helpful. Um, and I think to the lot, to one of the points you made, um, Ms. Nakajima, I think we are we are trying to position ourselves by providing information to the four towns in, in very clear, and as I described earlier, perhaps in more iterations to be more fair and share more information with the towns. And I think that's the conversation needs to happen from it. And I wonder, and it's truly an I wonder statement, um, whether the committee, because I heard a couple of people uh, in my opinion, imply, and then one more explicitly, would it make sense to have a school committee meeting half an hour before the Fort Town meeting so that you all will be well-versed and be able to see, not just see the information, but ask questions beforehand. I'm just conscious that seeing the slides might look different than having a discussion. Um, and it's not that something you need to, we need to make a decision on tonight, but certainly something that we could arrange and, and it wouldn't be atypical. Other committees sometimes have meetings before this and, and you know, I just think for someone getting a lot of slides, because this will be a lot of pretty detailed slides on different assessment formulas, I just, I don't know if a conversation might be helpful directly beforehand. Is it uh, You know, I, for what it's worth, I think that that's actually a really important thing to have happen. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a Saturday morning, and so it's difficult because, you know, people have families and they're working all week and all of that. At the same time, this is kind of what we do here. Like this is, you know, <laughs> this meeting, not to, you know, put too fine a point on it, but it is incredibly important for the long-term financial health and stability of the district. And so I think having, you know, the, the committee, I think as, as close to a full committee there as possible, mm -hmm. if not the full committee, uh, would be really amazing. And then I think also on top of that, providing some extra information for the school committee in advance uh, so that it's fresh in our minds, we're coming out of that conversation, you know, would also, I would, I would support that. Um, just a couple of points on the, on the, the town council variable, the more I think of it, uh, with these at least 11 people, <laughs> completely new, and this is a complicated topic, right, even being in it for a year. Um, you should probably reach out to them um, so that they can discuss what they want to do about it. Like, it, like you're either going to need to present to them at their first meeting, or they're going to have to have another town council meeting before that, right? Because they get inaugurated on a Sunday and then we meet Saturday, right? Yeah. That week they'll have to meet and, and therefore they'll have to talk about meeting on that Monday. Or you'll have to reach out to them and say, hey, I'm here for you. This is really complicated. You know, this isn't the kind of meeting where you can just, we can have 13 people making 20 minute co comments and questions, you know. And, and to just be there as a resource for them, sure. you know, because I would, I would hate to be a town councilor who's all wanting to do the right thing and get thrown into that, not knowing the importance of uh, everything that we just discussed. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. That helpful? Yep. Good. Um, just to, yes, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. When and where is this meeting? It's at the middle school library. It's on December 8th, and it's at what time? 9 o'clock. Yep. 9 o'clock. So we'd probably be meeting at 8.20 a.m., same location. Uh, or we can find a room off to the side. Yeah, I think we would likely do that. Yeah. So, well, I just meant the middle school. Yeah, absolutely. Nearby. Uh, RFQ um, for feasibility, uh, 
of planning at the high school and middle school. Mm -hmm. So we did a request for qualifications process for a designer to do the quasi uh, feasibility study, but more of like a building use study um, of the high school and the middle school with some different grade configurations. Um, so we posted that on September 26th. Um, we received over 20 applications. We had a ton of interest, more than I've ever seen for this type, for any design project. Um, we only received three uh, actual applications um, for this uh, from JCJ Architects, Steffi and Bradley Architects, and SMMA. Um, a committee comprised of myself, Ms. Kastensen, and Mr. Cody, who's our uh, facility um, kind of quasi-coordinator right now, um, reviewed all the applications, the technical applications. We reviewed those, evaluated them. Since we only had three, we invited them all in for interviews. We ranked them based on their interview responses. And so the total rankings based on both the technical piece and the interview piece was <coughs> JCJ received the highest score. Uh, Steffi and Bradley was just a smidge lower than JCJ. And then SMMA was a little bit less than uh, those two. So the process for the committee is to select one and approve that uh, hopefully tonight. Um, you can technically select any firm from the list, but if you select somebody other than the first firm, you have to have a written justification for why you selected that firm. And I'm happy to answer any questions, and Ms. Kastensen can as well. Ms. So Kastensen, do you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, that summed it up. I mean, it, this was um, actually really enjoyed being a part of those interviews. It was, um, it was fun, you know, just to see these different visions and what firms can do. Um, and it was difficult um, because the two top contenders were very close, and they both interviewed really, really well. And what set those two apart for me was their local expertise. Um, so one firm has worked in the district before and had a lot of experience in this particular area of like school consolidation or reconfigurations. Um, the other firm maybe hadn't done quite as much work with um, public schools in this department, but um, had someone who locally yep. uh, who lived here so um, both firms had you know really um, the resources of global architecture firms so they were it was a tough decision yep. and I spoke to a reference who actually has worked with both firms and had nothing uh, but good things to say about both firms um, uh, and their their work okay are there um, questions from the committee questions or comments to the committee yes uh, I was just going to say that JCJ Architects was the firm that was uh, working with the district around the last elementary school building project. Mm -hmm. We're correct. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I missed what around which project? The sorry, the the last uh, elementary school building project. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so, but you you were saying it's a matter of state law that if we pick someone other than. The first one, yeah. we have to provide a written justification, justification for why. Yeah. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. I move to uh, accept the RFQ from JCJ Architects per the recommendation of the review committee. Is there a second? So I moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Now would be your opportunity to provide a rationale for not choosing the first recommended vendor. Silence is golden. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Menino. Benino, aye. Demling, aye. Ordonez, aye. Sullivan, aye. Nakajima, aye. Kastensen, aye. McDonald, aye. There you have it. Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you. With two, with two not present, obviously. Unanimous among those who happen to be here, which should be obvious. Uh, is that it for you, Mr. McGonagall? I believe it is. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um, superintendent goals, item F. Sure. So I just want to thank also Ms. Kassinson for sitting in on that design committee. Uh, appreciate your time. So in terms of goals, um, so the, the differences from the prior version based on the feedback, one is sustained dispelled correctly on number two, so that's a minor <laughs> difference, but the more content specific uh, differences are number five and six, so you'll see that it says, you know, for the consideration of grade level spans for secondary buildings, school buildings, so that was based on feedback 
um, from the last meeting, and number six was drawn out much more with some sample items that were related to wellness. Um, the original goal was much much briefer and didn't spell out some potential what was intended to mean wellness was intended to mean in that goal. So those were the three changes that were made based on the feedback from the October Regional School Committee meeting. Great, thank you. Are there uh, questions from the committee? Ms. McDonald, anyone? None for me. Okay, committee. I don't have to be, I'm just asking. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the superintendent goals for this school year. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Demling, aye. Ordonez, aye. Sullivan, aye. Nakajima, aye. Kasman's an aye. McDonald, aye. Okay. Thank you. It passes unanimously by those who are present. Um, we got this under the wire so we can do your <laughs> mid-review. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one I've had in three years, so it's all good. before <laughs> April. That's right, exactly. Uh, PVCICS expansion letter. Funny, the title always baffles me. It's like the, the non, the opposition to expansion letter. Because it always, it always seems to, I guess it's good to write in the positive rather than the negative, right? Uh, Mr. Dumbling. Okay, so um, this is going to be a bit of duplication for all y'all at the Amherst level, but for the region. Um, if you were here on the region last year, the structure of this letter is quite similar to our final letter from last year. It begins with uh, some of our, our objection reasons, um, goes over a little bit of the history, uh, which is highlighted a little more um, clearly here, given that we have a new commissioner, who, um, and we want to emphasize the fact that there's been consistent um, position uh, on this issue from the past board and commissioners. Um, and then it goes into quite a lot of detail about the demographic um, shortfalls, um, again, using DESE's um, own data um, and, uh, and a bit of um, response to the school's response as to why these aren't problems. Um, and then a sort of a, a, a deep dive summary into, into one of the more egregious um, demographics. If, if you're following this along at home and you can't see the paper we're looking at, we're, we're basically we're talking about um, chronic and severe under-enrollment of low-income students with disabilities, uh, Hispanic students, high-need students, um, and that the special ed disparity is really quite dramatic. Um, so that's sort of called out here, as well as some references to some advocacy that some PVCICS parents had done a couple of years ago with regards to um, providing a welcoming and supporting environment for special needs students and families. Um, Mr. Nemo? Hmm? I mean, just to provide further context yes. for those watching at home, I mean, I know what you said this at the Amherst uh, School Committee meeting, that a particular reason for calling this out, apart from the fact that it, it's egregious and doesn't match up with um, desired goals for our public schools is that in their application, they you mentioned last time that they particularly called out that they were a um, you know a magnet or achievement school for uh, integration desegregation. You know. Yeah. The, the the quote is in in the proposal to Desi as to why they should expand is to allow students to attend desegregated integrated public schools as the school has proven to be an engine of integration in Hampshire County. So, right. so, so it's directly pertinent to their current exactly. application that in fact the numbers belie kind of radically yes. um, the, yeah. the veracity of that statement. Yep. Um, and then the, the last page, just to finish the summary, um, there's a section about the, the finance uh, formula which uh, is, is short because Desi does not have control of it, and we, we sort of are making the assumption that that is not an argument that particularly resonates with the Board of Commissioner, but it is something that obviously matters to us, and so we include it there. And then the sort of history and annotations at the end. Okay. Comments or questions on the committee? Is there notice? Um, I just want to say thank you again to Mr. Dillon for pulling this together. I think it's a fabulous letter, and I really don't have any concerns or uh, you know, edits or anything like that. I think uh, the only thing that I would point out is that we heard 
from both Springfield and Holyoke school committee members um, that this school has appeared to be targeting their uh, districts and communities in particular and probably to try and help you know, sort of change the perception of, of, um, of their school. And they have been advertising that they are the engine of integration. Um, so this is, these are statements that they are making repeatedly in public, uh, despite the data showing up otherwise. My, my only other, uh, the only question I have is, I, I guess I'm not familiar with Representative-elect Natalie Blaze. I don't know who that is, I'm, I'm sorry. So she uh, is the newly elected representative who took uh, Stephen Kulik's seat. So she represents uh, yeah, a celebrity in Shutesbury. So at the region, comes in too. Thank you. And she'll rock and roll. Absolutely. And great. I, I, I should make a note, it just be, well, because you bring up Natalie Blay, as I was getting the uh, contact information for the new representatives, she specifically calls out fully funding regional transportation uh, on her campaign website. So if, if we're worried about you know our new representatives understanding what our priorities are, I think we're... I think we're good there. <laughs> She's fantastic. She's fantastic. You should actually, you don't know her? I don't. You should get to know her. She's yeah. really a wonderful person. Yeah, great. I mean, they all are, but I mean, she's... Yeah. And they all seem to be working together, too. Yeah, so. yeah. I knew Representative Hewlett, but not... Uh, not yeah. So, um, are there other questions or comments? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. Um, yep, I'll move to approve our um, letter opposing the expansion of the PVC ICS. Is there a second? Second. So moved and second. Any additional comments? Beautifully written. Thank you. Yeah. It is very well nicely written. I'll just add up my, my thank you also to Mr. Demling for this um, great letter, the second one. <laughs> great. From the Hammers and the Regional Committee. So it's awesome. Great. You know, and on that note, I think we're going to start with you this time, Ms. McDonald. <laughs> okay. McDonald, I. Castman's and I. Nakajima, I. Sullivan, I. Ordona's, I. Demling, I. Benino I. Okay. Carries unanimously and can go forth and have great impact, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> H, 2019-2020 school year calendar. So, um, last year uh, we decided based on feedback to try to have the school committee approve the following year's school calendar before the end of the calendar year based just as it, families staff members really appreciated having the um, earlier notice typically was more in the springtime which for some families was complicated um, and so our process that we instituted two years ago was that um, Ms. Westmoreland does a great job setting up initial draft. We get feedback from our superintendent planning council, which is district directors, from our principals, and then we meet with the Amherst Pelham Association leadership. They then offer feedback, and we come up with um, an agreement to share with faculty. Contractually, uh, the APA takes a vote, and they have to affirmatively vote if we're going to have a pre-Labor Day start. We've had that for at least 15 years. Did you say? Yeah. At least 15 years, uh, but we have to offer a pre and post Labor Day start option to the APEA. We had that meeting last week, uh, last Thursday, I think, with the APA leadership. They've now presented these options to the faculty. We'll, they will get us uh, the response as well before the December uh, Regional School Committee meeting. But it's an opportunity for you to review, ask any questions. There's really only one substantive change from last year to this year is or from this year to next year however you want to think about it um <laughs> is that if you remember we had a very hot start of the school year and our first day of school was a half day and there was a universal feeling among students and faculty that it was a wonderful way to start the school year that having you know an earlier release allowed for the kind of community building and uh welcoming feel um people had struggled to make that last for six hours or seven hours, right? Then you sort of delve into content. And, and so people didn't love the 98 degree heat and 98% humidity of the day, but they did really appreciate uh, how it felt. And we used to have an early release as the first day of school all the way back. And so this was a request that I got. Uh, we received lots Why of feedback. Why did you remind us of that 98 degree day? Because it's 38 and raining. Um, I'll take my 98. Um, but... Uh, but um, so that's the only kind of substantive change. Otherwise, everything is the s slight date variations, but everything else um, is pretty identical to the current school year, both on the pre and post Labor Day start. Can you remind the committee why we don't align uh, any of our 
breaks with the five colleges. So uh, the question comes up every couple of years, why don't we have a March break instead of a February and April break, which is particularly in New England, this is pretty typical, but outside New England, most school districts have one break in the spring and it happens in March. And so this is not a I agree or don't agree statement, but the, the chair and I spoke, and there's actually a school committee policy that dictates that there is a February break and an April break uh, each spring, or each winter and spring. So when that conversation comes to me, um, my short answer is the school committee has a policy. We can't do that. I have a longer <laughs> answer if anyone's interested. I'm not sure at 938 it's people well, are interested. I think, I think, it's, I think it's worth mentioning yeah, sure. a slightly longer answer mm -hmm. now also, which is um, – the majority, vast majority, yeah. vast majority of staff. I, yeah, majority. I can, I'll just say it. Yeah, majority or vast majority. Just tell me. I would just say majority. Majority. Majority staff doesn't live in our district, and so if they have kids, their kids aren't going to this school district, which means even though there's hue and cry, that's perfectly reasonable, by the way, perfectly reasonable, hue and cry from people who work at UMass or Amherst College or something, where they'd say, um, I really wish you could align the breaks with. Um, our breaks so that if I want to take my kids, I don't have to take them out of school and we can have a really great spring break, which totally makes sense. It's perfectly reasonable. It turns out there's a countervailing voice from a lot of the staff who actually work in the district whose lives would be disrupted if their kids' breaks totally didn't line up with when their break was and vice versa. So they'd have daycare needs and, or you know, custodial needs sometime when they can't take off and then they would have an opportunity to go away at a time in which their kids can't and they'd have to pull them out of school. And so it's one of those things that I think for a lot of us as school committee members, we get a lot of feedback from our constituents, which is totally understandable and reasonable, about isn't it obvious you'd do it this way? And it turns out once you dig a little deeper, there are actually arguments to, <laughs> to not do it, but also feel reasonable in their own way which makes it comp or irrespective of, super, yeah. of school committee policy. After 44 years living in town, I finally got a good explanation for that. Thank you. <laughs> I don't see I only actually have a, a question, and then I apologize for adding to this late, <laughs> the late um, meeting time, but um, that explanation about the breaks is answered um, to the lady, to Mr. Menino, the, the longstanding question that I've always had. But, it, <coughs> but one question I, I do have um, is the... Um, is, is our end date. So when we are ending in that last week of June, um, I, I personally just really, really question the, the amount of learning that's actually happening in those last five to ten days of school when we've added five, um, five plus uh, snow days. And I went, I, it, you know, and it, it sounds like it, it's policy driven and so it's not something that we can impact for 1920, but just would love to ask the question, and maybe it's not for tonight, maybe it's for another time to understand what, you know, how did we might end up in the situation if that plays, if that's just perception from my, you know, as a parent in the, in the school district, you know, hearing my kids talk about the, basically the last week and a half of school, they're watching movies um, and not really doing a lot of learning in school. Is there ways that we can think through the calendar in ways to pepper those those extra snow days in other parts of the calendar year so that they're actually impact, impactful learning days as opposed to movies and popcorn. So I think I'm not 100% sure when you say pepper, I think I'm just trying to get a better sense of what, what that but, means. Um, right. So... Um, you know, whether it's eliminating um, one day of, of a vacation day, so, you know, taking away one day in February or one day in April. It sounds like policy-driven, we have to have a vacation. Is it mandated in the policy that it's five days? Um, it, it, you know, it, and if it is, then obviously the answer is no, we can't do anything about it but, um, without changing policy. Um, but it just it just seems to me when we when we have the snow days and we tack them on at the end of the school year in June, doesn't it sound like there's opportunity to move up the start of the school year, you know, a few days to, to counter it so that it's you know, some of those snow days are taken up at the front of the school year and some are at the end of the school year if needed. Um, I I just consistently, you know, see nothing happening in those extra five days that get that get added on the, at the end of the school calendar year. 
Do you have a couple responses? Yeah, so one is I'm concerned to hear about popcorn in movies because that's not my experience. So I think we could certainly bring that up either at school committee level or we could certainly connect as you feel better uh, individually about that because that is not, um, I'm not saying that's not your child's experience or other children's experience. It, it hasn't been the experience in two schools I've worked at. Um, I think there is a lightening of load and so realization that the end of the school year happens. My perception of that, you know, I have some family who live in a southern state where the school year ends on Memorial Day-ish. They have the same thing that happens at the end of May, right? There's something about days 176 to 180 that no matter what day of the week or what day of the month or what month it is, that there's a natural, you know, crescendo down, whatever that is. De um, sorry, I'm not a music person. I'm looking at Mr. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, to That happens. Now, I don't think popcorn and movies is the answer, and again, we could follow up offline. I also think when we have one-day weeks, our attendance is, is pretty terrible. So one of the things you'll notice, I didn't point it out specifically, is if you look at the December break on either calendar, we're choosing not to have the school on Des Monday, December 23rd, and then have the break starting on the 24th. And that's when our experience is that when we have short weeks, frankly, even this week, which was a two-day week, we've seen a decline in attendance, right? Okay. And so um, we certainly could add a day to those weeks, I just I wonder about what our attendance from teacher teacher attendance will be, staff attendance I should say, what our student attendance will be, and how much learning will actually happen in those days. Given that uh, our experience has been, when we have one day weeks, um, they generally are, are there's not a tremendous amount of learning that happens on that day. So that's my sorry long winded answer. Yeah, and so that would hold true also for that June twenty second date if we need to go to that. It would right absolutely. Yeah, and hopefully we won't because we just, and I'm not a believer in snow. Um, <laughs> Mr. Sullivan knows. I've been talking to his department at 445 the last three school days. Um, but, um, but, you know, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And then we get into a blizzard bag conversation, which is another topic for another day if the group wanted to go in. And I'm not a fan but um, at all. Um, but, you know, that's the way some school districts deal with when you get over a certain number of snow days so that you don't have these one-off kind of days. Um, but I'm not a proponent of that. So, so I just wanted to say as a child of two educators that, I re that the February vacation was very special to us because we went as a family, we'd go skiing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, that, was, that was something that I would never ever want to give up. <laughs> Chairman? So process-wise, this is for our review, and the APEA votes it first, and then we vote it? So they vote. So in order for me to bring forward a pre-Labor Day schedule for your consideration and actual vote, the APA has to vote to support a pre-Labor Day start first. So contractually, they, they have that right. Now, again, many, many years in a row they will. I have a strong hunch, based on my conversation with the leadership, that that trend will continue, um, and then we bring it forward for a vote in December. So they're not necessarily voting, and they're sort of are voting on a schedule, but they're really voting that they support a pre-Labor Day start because contractually we need that before I can bring a formal recommendation to you. Is it wrong? So I, I just have a question about uh, April. Mm -hmm. So looking at the, these weird blocks of time that show up sometimes, right, one of the things that I see um, community members responding to sometimes negatively is when you have these weird weeks, like the week of April 6th, where you have April 8th, which is an early release day, and then April 10th is, you know, a day off, right? Um, you know, trying to find uh, child care, staggering work, and right. all that stuff, and it's not an official holiday week, right? And then you, two weeks later, you actually have spring break is really challenging. So I'm wondering if there's any way to move up you know, and, and maybe not, but if there, you know, if, if you've thought about maybe moving that half day to April 1st, moving that back a week, you would have two consecutive half days, weeks. But, I, you know, I guess it's, it's sort of a weighing, and I'm not sure, you know, what kind of thought process went into this, like yeah. in this particular pattern. Yeah, so I can speak to that. Actually, uh, we have thought about that, and the state has not yet released their MCAS schedule, but in, they typically have, man, uh, at the high school level, there are days where MCAS have to occur. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like a window, it's like right. the test. And it typically is the, the week that spans March and April. So we're avoiding that week for an early release because 10th um, be graders are likely to have 
MCAS that day, and if kids, if students leave early, I mean, yes, they could stay, but that causes all sorts of unfair pressure on students. Um, so that that's the reason for that. I'm aware of that sort of awkward wrinkle, but um, that's where we are. So I guess yeah. the, the question is, would it be possible to move that half day to the following week, then, the week of the 13th, you know, and have it be the 15th or something? Again, just trying to think if there's a way to provide mm -hmm. some relief to, you know, parents who are trying to find alternate, you know, and maybe it's not that much relief, I, you know, I don't know, but mm -hmm. it seems like um, looking at the calendar, that's the only time where you really have this really awkward, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise it's a great calendar. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good feedback. We can take that back. Great, and it'll be on, this will be on the next agenda. Yeah, and thank okay. you to the APA for making their vote process fit with the school committee process. They've Absolutely, been, they've been, they've and I love the fact they're voting first. Yeah. yeah, it answers the question of is this going to cause holy hell when it's approved? Yeah, it's like apparently <laughs> not. Uh, gifts. We have a sheet of paper with gifts on them. If anyone is inclined to be vocal right now, they can read it as a motion. I move to approve the following gifts from Fallon Elementary PTO, um, PTO Inc. number 1495 um, for professor professional development breakfast, 11618 in, in the amount of $100, and from Pat Hardnet to support donation of clothing to Family Center, uh, total amount estimate 250 for a grand total of $100. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Roll call vote starting with Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Demling, aye. Cordona's aye. Sullivan, aye. Nakajima. Casperson, aye. McDonald, aye. And so it is approved unanimously. Anyone make, want to make any comment on that, by the way? I realize I rushed the vote through. <laughs> no, apparently they don't. Uh, upcoming topics. Do we have any? Yeah. So budget guidance presentations calendar vote I um, think we'll be able to bring something on capital um, to see if that timing works but we'd like to bring something on capital um, math or do you say math that? Uh, I was getting there uh, math discussion uh, location of meetings interlocal agreement tips uh, which I did find out what was that was and now I've forgotten because I've been up at 430 in the morning the last couple <laughs> mornings so it's not fresh in my mind um, <coughs> And uh, MSAN students, hopefully, will be able to come. I want to confirm with them. It's loosely confirmed, but I'd like them if we could do the beginning of the meeting so that they can go about and not be here late. Um, I have to find out about new courses. We may have one okay. um, new course for your consideration. And that's, let me see if. And do you want to do the question I raised in the chair's report? You want to do with that superintendent update or? Um, we could. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, it could be its own item. It's up to the committee. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. We'll, talk, we'll talk and talk about it offline. Yeah. Can I make one comment before? Of course. Uh, I just want to make a comment on the importance of wellness. Um, my daughter had a, um, uh, what was it called? A um, shelter in place um, practice. It, it was one or two days following the tragedy in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And um, the Milton police came into the freshman dorm and they did the shelter in place thing. And the police were so excited because every freshman knew exactly what to do. They didn't teach them anything. And they thanked the students for knowing how to do it. And my daughter being very sensitive to that, she got mad. And she actually told them that, you know, this isn't, I'm not, proud of this. This is something I've been practicing since kindergarten. Yeah. And she was real, you know, she and a few of her friends got really upset mm. with the fact that they were, you know, being high-fived, that they knew how to shelter in place. Mm. Right. That's sad. That's what she said. But, it I mean, was, that's, it that's, was real, that, but that's what's going on now. Yeah, I remember that was a conversation we had last year as a school committee. I think Mr. Ardoni has brought this up around the, the notion that we're normal. We, we both have to create a safe environment and do things that do that. And at the same time, it's just a sickness that we're normalizing the idea that, you know, you may very well experience a, a mass trauma event. And it's just like a natural part of our lives. It's crazy. Yeah. 
Thanks for sharing. Uh, are, there, are there other school committee planning related items at this point? Otherwise, you can do so offline. I didn't even welcome that. So if not, Ms. Jonas, you have a motion? I move to adjourn. Is there a second? I have a second. Hey, roll call vote, Mr. Manino. <laughs> Manino, aye. Emily, aye. Ordonez, aye. Sullivan, aye. Nakajima, aye. Castman's an aye. Ms. Donald, aye. We are adjourned and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for your patience with me on the phone. Feel better. You were great. I, I, I